All right, well, welcome everyone to our annual research symposium. My name is Cassie Adams, and I'm the Care Services Director for ALS Northwest. ALS Northwest is a nonprofit supporting people living with ALS and their loved ones throughout Oregon and Southwest Washington. Our mission is trifold. We are here to support people living with ALS to live their lives to the fullest, to advocate for people living with ALS, and to fund research and science to find treatments and a cure for this disease. We appreciate you being all here today. I really believe that it takes all of us coming together to fuel the research mission. From the scientists working in the labs, to the clinicians bringing clinical trials to the multidisciplinary centers all across the world, to the people living with ALS who are participating in clinical trials and the research that bring us closer to treatments and a cure. It also takes all of the family members, the friends, the community supporters, and all of our sponsors that are in the room to make research possible. I wanna take a few moments just to recognize our sponsors today. And they are all kind of around the room, so if you haven't had a chance to stop by and say hello, you can do that um, before the end of the program today. So I'd like to thank Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma America, United Access, Providence Brain and Spine Institute, Fortis Construction, Pharma, Performance Home Medical, and Amelix. Let's give them a hand. So we're really excited today to be joined by clinicians and researchers that are engaging in really meaningful work to better understand this complicated and challenging disease. First, we'll be hearing from Dr. Anson Wilkes with Oregon Health Sciences here in Portland. Next, we'll be hearing from Dr. Nicholas Olney from the Providence ALS Center here in Portland. Next, we'll be hearing from Dr. Robert Bowser, who came all the way from Arizona, Barrow Neurological Institute, to join us today. And even further, Dr. Bob Dagger from um, Brainstorm Cell Therapeutics. He came all the way from Boston, so thank you so much for being here. Awesome. And last, we'll finish off today with a panel question and answer session. You'll see some scrap paper on your tables today. We really encourage all of you, as you're listening to the presentations, to jot down any questions that you have. We'll have volunteers and staff members coming through in between the presentations to collect those for the Q&A session. A couple more housekeeping items before we get started. Um, out through that door to the left are your restrooms. And we won't be taking any breaks between the session today, so please feel free to get up, walk around, grab some delicious cookies and coffee at the back of the room, and come back when you're ready. So without further ado, I'm really excited to announce our first speaker. Dr. Anson Wilkes is an assistant professor of neurology at Oregon Health Sciences University, where he also serves as the co-director of the ALS clinic. Dr. Wilkes grew up in the Northeast and the South. He received a BA in chemistry at Vanderbilt University and attended New York Medical College. There he received his medical degree. He then completed neurology residency and neuromuscular medicine fellowship training at Washington University in St. Louis. In addition to neurology and neuromuscular medicine, he is board certified in electrodiagnostics and has a certificate of added qualifications in neuromuscular ultrasound. We are honored to have Dr. Wilkes join us this after afternoon, particularly as he has a six-month-year-old at home. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Wilkes. Thank you for that introduction. All right. So my first talk, again, my name is Anson Wilkes. Um, I work as co-director at the OHSU ALS Clinic. Um, and my talk today is going to be rather basic, kind of a framework um, to better understand ongoing current research in ALS, kind of reviewing ALS in general, and pathomechanisms of disease. 
I don't have any disclosures. Before discussing current research, it is sometimes useful to look to kind of historical figures that have contributed to ALS. This pictured here in this picture is uh, Sir Charles Bell, who described the disease in 1824. This is a very famous figure in neurology, um, Jean-Martin Charcot um, of charcot Mary tooth which is you know, hereditary neuropathies eponymously named after him. Um, and he, in the 1870s, began first using the term amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Um, and then finally, many of you probably recognize this figure, um, very famous New York Yankees baseball player known colloquially as the Iron Horse, Lou Gehrig, who unfortunately succumbed to the disease at age 37 um, in 1941, at a rather young age, kind of in his prime. Um, so Lou Gehrig, for which we get the, the name Lou Gehrig's disease, eponymously named. I want to review ALS just kind of what it is. So it's a neurodegenerative disorder of upper and lower motor neurons. As you can see in this figure here on the right, it demonstrates the brain and let me get one thing here. You can see the sulcus here is the pre frontal sulc, the, the prefrontal gyrus, excuse me, and the sulcus here, this is the motor strip. This is where the upper motor neurons are housed. So this is what gets affected in ALS as the upper motor neuron involvement. From this motor strip, they send projections down into the brainstem and spinal cord in the cortical spinal tracts, they're called, and then synapse on the lower motor neurons, which are in this ventral part, so anterior or front of the spinal cord, the ventral horn is where those lower motor neurons are housed. And those send out nerves that innervate muscle. And what happens with ALS is there's upper motor neuron degeneration, which manifests as slowness or incoordination and also um, what's termed spasticity medically or stiffness is what is that, that the experience of that and then brisk reflexes. Lower motor neuron involvement manifests more with frank atrophy of the muscle and, and weakness that's experienced. And then muscle fasciculations is the term for that twitching that is very common that is not specific to ALS but is a hallmark of the lower motor neuron involvement um, that occurs. What's very characteristic of ALS is that sensation is entirely spared. So there may be pain, um, but not from primary nerve irritation or compression, but often more related to immobility and weakness of joint stabilizing muscles that contributes to pain. So pain is, can be very common, but sensory nerve involvement would not be um, typical. What's very characteristic of ALS as well is that extraocular muscles and muscles that control urination and bowel control are relatively spared. Um, and then these muscles that are under voluntary control can be affected um, to varying degrees and in any distribution. So muscles that control swallowing or speech, the diaphragm, which controls you know, breathing, the arms and legs, any of those muscles can be involved. The course is an inexorable progression with an average of three to five years across populations, but there are patients that are outliers that have a very rapid progression, but also patients um, can have a much slower progression and live decades with the disease in a minority of cases. The diagnosis is stratified based on these qualifiers of possible, probable, and definite based on the extent of involvement of various body regions. You can see on the schematic here, this figure on the right, the brain stem, which is bulbar. Those are speech and swallowing, head control functions. Cervical is the arms. It also controls the diaphragm, so breathing. Um, thoracic is not as overt commonly clinically, but involves trunk muscles, so what are called the paraspinal muscles that are um, integral to maintaining an erect posture. Um, and then the lumbar body region, which is, you know, the legs, obviously. 
Um, with the thoracic you know, involvement and kind of involvement elsewhere, we often evaluate for that with electromyography and nerve conduction studies, both to rule out mimics, but also to evaluate for potentially subclinical involvement that may not be as overt clinically, but present on the EMG, which is the needle test. Um, and that really evaluates for lower motor neuron involvement, which is indicated by the yellow um, kind of lines there, and the upper motor neurons are the, the blue. We have various um, diagnostic criteria that are in use, the El Escorial, Waji, and Gold Coast criteria. These are very important clinically, but also of critical importance for clinical trials and clinical research because you know, for scientific rigor, we want to make sure that every variable is accounted for in clinical trials. So a high level of certainty in diagnosis um, when we're conducting research. As far as epidemiology, ALS is the third most common neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. It really should be considered in the same group. The distinction really is the area of the central nervous system that's involved, and in this case, um, the lower motor neurons, which is also part of the peripheral nervous system. But they are all neurodegenerative diseases. And there's approximately 7,000 new cases of ALS um, per year in the United States, new diagnoses. Uh, the incidence of ALS increases with every decade, and particularly beyond age 40. So it is a more common disorder of the advanced age, but really can happen at, at any ages. The peak risk really uh, occurs at around age 74 per some studies. Um, and the male to female ratio is 1.3 to 1.5. As far as risk factors, there's a lot of study looking into environmental exposures and risk factors that might contribute to ALS, um, but really the only proven known ones that are definitive are age and a positive family history. The possible risk factors, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, include military service, traumatic injury, and those are probably, you know, confounding variables. It might be partly contributing you know, together. Um, occupational exposure to electrical fields, heavy metal exposure, pesticide exposure, smoking history has been studied as well and possibly um, is an increased risk and that may be related to heavy metals that are in um, tobacco smoke. Um, what's particularly interesting with ALS is this phenomenon that's been studied um, that would suggest a lower BMI or pre-morbid decreased body fat may be a risk factor for ALS, at least per several studies, um, as well as athleticism, increased athleticism. There's research that has suggested that gut microbiome factors might contribute to ALS risk as well, and that's an area of research. With these risk factors, there's been an interest, particularly in highly, you know, um, characteristic clustering um, or hotspots of ALS. So the ALS Parkinson dementia complex of Guam, it, it, the phenomenon also occurs in other areas in the Western Pacific, but essentially in those regions, there's a 50 to 100 fold increased risk of ALS along with features of Parkinsonism and dementia. Um, and there's, this has been obviously a, a you know, area of, of extensive research, and it's hypothesized that this could be related to consumption of the cycad, which is rich in beta N methyl amino L alanine, or BMAA. And this is an excitatory amino acid that has been demonstrated to induce neuronal cell death in animal models. Um, the person on this trial, um, or the study, I should say, um, is actually at OHSU. Um, and that is Dr. Peter Spencer. Um, so this is a publication in Science that really looked into this. But one of the critiques of this is that in order for what was demonstrated in, in animal models um, to induce what appeared to be a motor neuron disease was a very high level of BMMA exposure, which realistically probably would not have occurred um, you know, in, in the these regions, but this was you know, a convincing case that this might have been a clear environmental exposure that contributed to ALS development. 
With environmental exposure, um, there is another kind of, you know, the flip side to that coin, and that's a genetic background that contributes to ALS. So the vast majority of patients are, have, you know, with ALS are sporadic, and this is also called acquired. Um, five to 10% of cases are familial, and the way that this is transmitted in the vast majority of cases is in autosomal dominant manner. And what that is, to review that, is um, every gene has two copies, um, and you only need one pathogenic variant in order to manifest with the disease. Um, the most common genes involved are listed up here in the top two, so chromosome 9 open reading frame or C9-ORF72 repeat expansions, and superoxide dismutase 1 or SOD1 account for uh, roughly half of cases of familial ALS. Um, and then FUS and TRD, TRAD, TARDBP uh, variants are other um, more common familial forms of ALS, but there are many different genes that have been invoked. Um, and what's interesting is that aside from these cases where there is a very clear genetic mechanism, um, is this concept of genetic susceptibility to ALS, even in patients with what apparently sporadic ALS. So we're finding more and more, particularly as genetic testing has become more available and um, clinically available um, for most patients, and there was a recent update recommending offering this to most patients, um, is that we're finding these pathogenic variants in patients with what would appear to be sporadic ALS, and this has prompted the term singleton ALS instead of sporadic ALS. What's also interesting is the concept of incomplete penetrance in patients with uh, familial ALS, particularly with specific variants, this isoleucine to uh, 113 to threonine point mutation um, in SOD1 ALS that can manifest even within family, you know, between family members um, with a 40 year difference in age of onset and a rapid different, you know, a, a difference in rate of progression. What contributes to that is unclear, but um, there is some suggestion that potentially um, other genetic, you know, contributions are at play, are, are, are you know, instrumental. So with SOD1, which is by default, um, and in most cases, an autosomal dominant disorder, there is a variant, um, aspartic acid at the 90 position to um, alanine um, that really in many cases is autosomal recessive. Um, and why that occurs is not entirely clear, but the research into this and, um, has posited that it might be related to a tightly linked protective factor in these cases. So other genetics that influence the way this gene manifests. Um, because in these cases, patients with essentially one variant may not develop disease. Um, and there are family histories where the recessive disorder manifests and patients with only one mutation may not develop disease. Um, so this has prompted the thought that sporadic ALS and even the reason that there's incomplete penetrance and variable penetrance with familial ALS is that there's an oligogenic or polygenic component to ALS that contributes to when the disease will manifest or if the disease will manifest. So this figure encapsulates that. So the, the top column demonstrates typical what we'd call Mendelian inheritance. So you see two different gene variants, capital A and lowercase a, um, and when they're inherited, there's a 25% chance of inheriting both copies of the little, the lowercase a, and a 25% chance of both inheriting both copies of the uppercase a. So this is the, the basic concept of autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive inheritance in one, dom in one gene. In the second column, there is a representation of a more complicated genetic pattern of inheritance, and to use as an example, this would be height or intelligence quotient or IQ, where presumably multiple genes are contributing and there's environmental noise that kind of allows for a bell-shaped curve to be adopted. 
Um, and then the third column is what has been proposed as a model for ALS, which is called the liability threshold model, whereby there are multiple genetic contributions and environmental factors that create a burden of disease causing factors and a critical threshold at which you can see that disease may occur and below that, no disease. And this may reach a certain point at a certain, you know, at a certain age in the case of familial ALS or be the, the reason that certain patients will develop ALS versus not, um, which is an interesting focus and area of research. So with the actual pathomechanism of ALS, we don't know precisely, but many of these different processes have been invoked, particularly with aberrant RNA processing. We're fairly certain that does occur in familial ALS. Um, so the RNA is the transcript of DNA, and that's used in turn to make um, proteins, translated proteins. Um, and when this RNA is processed aberrantly, it can contribute to aggregate formation. Um, this is kind of what is thought to be the case in SOD1 ALS and is the target of um, therapies, one of which has been FDA approved, which I'll touch on very briefly. The concept of excitotoxicity is also invoked. Um, and what this essentially means is that there are certain neurotransmitters that create a nerve transmission response. And if there's too much um, kind of excitation, the nerve can be damaged to the point where there's a trigger for kind of cell death processes. So that's been invoked and that's really the target of Rylazol. Um, which is one of the, the, the first FDA-approved medication. And then protein misfolding is, is readily evident on pathology, which I'll show a slide on the next slide, what we see in ALS. Apoptosis is a physiologic process. It protects against aberrant processes like cancer. Um, but when it occurs, when it shouldn't, it may be contributing to the neuronal death that occurs in ALS. And then finally, an area of research is inflammation may be a contributing factor to ALS. It's very useful to look you know, at a macro and microscopic level of what's occurring at a tissue level for ALS. And really what you see is loss of those motor neurons and intracellular inclusions. So with this figure, you can see on the right, there's normal control. And this is the thoracic um, spinal cord. This is autopsy specimens, obviously. And then the lumbar spinal cord. Again, this is dorsal or in the back, so, and this is ventral, so the front. And what we see here is the area of the corticospinal tracts. And then it, on the inset, you can see that this is a normal appearance, but loss of those corticospinal tracts, myelinated um, corticospinal tracts in patients with ALS. And then here is the ventral horn. So these are the lower motor neurons and these darkly staining fuchsia structures, the pink structures are motor neurons. And what we see is motor neuron loss in the case of ALS. What you see on this is aggregate formation. So these are very common aggregates that you see in ALS. So ubiquitin, TDP43, and then phosphorylated TDP43. Phosphorylated TDP43 is not physiologic. So you don't see any staining here. And this staining here is, is in a patient with ALS. TDP43 is a normal protein, but what happens in ALS is it's mislocalized. So this is the nucleus right here, and you can see that it is normally staining in the control patient, but it is, has been moved from the nucleus and accumulates as these aggregates in patients with ALS. And that goes for ubiquitin as well. It's been described as a kind of skein-like kind of inclusion here, which is absent in um, the control patients without ALS. So these hallmarks of ALS are motor neuron loss and aggregate formation. Um, these, these aggregates are not, you know, unique to ALS and are seen in many other neurodegenerative disorders. And whether these aggregates are kind of 
akin to the pathology, what the pathomechanism is, is not entirely clear either. We know that the beta amyloid plaques in, in Alzheimer's disease don't, don't always correlate perfectly with, with clinical, um, the clinical kind of picture of the patient, um, but these are definitely pathological hallmarks of the disease. And what's interesting is that both this pathology um, and clinical kind of progression of a patient um, tends to often follow a contiguous spread. So what we see here in this figure is a schematic of um, the various areas of onset for patients. So you see, you know, this uh, represents um, multifocal or generalized kind of onset symptoms or focal onset. And in this paper, they retrospectively looked at 913 patients and followed them clinically to see where the weakness kind of manifested next. And what they found is that in the case of upper motor neuron predominance, so again, that's the upper motor neurons kind of spasticity or slowness of movement tended to move vertically, as in ipsilaterally. So if it started in the hand, it might move to the leg. Again, these aren't hard and fast rules, but that was the general trend. And then with lower motor neuron involvement, um, it tended to spread within the spinal cord and contralaterally, suggesting a local spread of the disease, um, which is very interesting and has been duplicated in an autopsy kind of report or paper looking at this um, and essentially looking at the pathology for patients with different areas of onset. And what you can see, I think it's big enough, good. You can see control patients, the heavily staining blue areas that stand out from the background are motor neurons and these are spinal cord sections and this is from the hypoglossal nucleus and the brain stem. And what you can see is that with these various areas of onset. So this is where you'd expect there to be loss of motor neurons and bulbar onset. As we move farther away just from, you know, a geographic area in, in the central nervous system, you can see that the density is much greater and there's much fewer, you know, the, the loss is much less um, of, of the motor neurons. And that goes the same for arm onset. We see this here is where there's mo most heavy kind of loss of motor neurons and then thoracic where there's severe loss of motor neurons. And then finally in the leg where you see as opposed to the bulbar onset, um, there's relative preservation of motor neurons in, you know, areas that are a far, a far distance from where the actual onset um, occurs. So this has led to hypotheses about the spread of ALS um, and theory of a prion-like mechanism. So ALS is not prion disease, and I want to make that very clear. Um, you know, prion disease is a transmissible infectious disease. Um, it's an entirely different entity, but this idea of prion-like spread has been suggested. Um, and this is a typical somatic of what we'd expect with prion disease, where a normal protein sort of affects the conformational structure of, or the, the abnormal protein affects the conformational structure of normal protein to induce this kind of aggregate sheet, um, this inclusion. Um, again, this is a separate entity. It's not infectious, it's not transmissible in ALS, but this whole notion of um, kind of changing the conformational shape of proteins and contributing to aggregate for formation at a local level has been suggested. So what we see here are normal proteins. Again, TDP43 is a normal protein, but it's an aggregate we see um, on pathology. And SOD1, one of the more common variants of familial ALS, this aggregate induces this change in conformational structure of the protein, which contributes to this essentially elongating aggregate that may break into seeds that may itself get exposed to neighboring cells, either by cell death or by extrusion of these aggregates in certain other cells that may be contributing in ALS as well besides neurons and taken up locally via local spreads. So this is one of the hypotheses for why we see that 
picture of kind of contiguous spread of ALS. Again, it's not entirely proven because not all ALS patients behave this way and the idea of non-contiguous spread does occur. So I want to kind of change gears for the last part of, of this kind of talk and discuss the current treatment that's, you know, there's a lot of options for symptom-based treatment in ALS, but I'll really focus this on therapies that have proven to extend life or slow down the rate of progression. And really, aside from the FDA-approved medications, the most important intervention in my mind is non-invasive ventilation. Um, there are various indications to start this, so not every patient with ALS automatically needs to start on non-invasive ventilation, but we do typically monitor pulmonary function tests and other parameters to identify this early because when patients meet certain criteria, there's clear evidence that using non-invasive ventilation um, can prolong life and improve quality of life. So this will probably never be replicated because of ethical concerns, but the initial clinical trial looking at non-invasive ventilation um, showed a significant survival benefit of seven months. I'll mention this on the next slide, but Rilazole per the clinical trial estimated about a three-month survival benefit. Um, both of these in recent more kind of retrospective studies may suggest an even longer benefit, but as you can see, there's probably no question that non-invasive ventilation um, has a probably greater effect size than current available disease-modifying therapy as, as in medications. Um, and this probably contributes for various reasons. It certainly delays deterioration of respiratory function, but it may be related to hypoxia that the disease itself is, um, the progression is, is slowed. So I'm going to briefly touch on disease-modifying therapies that are available. So this is Rilazol, the oldest, the first FDA-approved medication for ALS. The, you're going to see a trend here that with many of the medications available, the exact mechanism is not known, but we, you know, it does affect glutamate, um, you know, activity. It inhibits glutamate release and essentially amounts to decreased excitotoxicity of neurons. But there are probably more complicated mechanisms at play here. With Adaravone, Radicava, it scavenges free radicals and prevents oxid oxidative tissue injury in the CNS. With the most recently approved medication, which is Relivrio or sodium phenylbutyrate torosodiol, the most recently approved medication for sporadic ALS, I should say, blocks cell death pathways in the mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum. But again, these mechanisms of action for these drugs are probably more complicated than just the kind of one bullet point I have here. Um, and then more recently, the you know, antisense oligonucleotide therapy that was approved for SOD1 ALS, the first of its kind, um, is, you know, you'll see the absence of exact mechanism not known and that this is a very targeted therapy. It binds to and causes degradation of SOD1 mRNA and re reduces SOD1 protein synthesis. So this is a very, you know, burgeoning area of interest um, in research looking at familial forms of ALS and gene therapies. Um, and this is an intrathecal therapy, which means it's given um, as a spinal tap, essentially, into the spinal fluid. And these are all FDA approved at this point. I want to briefly touch on the efficacy of these drugs. And I will say that they are by no means cures as a whole, as a class. Um, they have a modest effect size, and Rilazol increased survival by probably an estimated three months based on the clinical trial. It may be longer based on more recent studies that are more kind of retrospective, but um, it, it has a modest effect size. Um, Idaravone actually had an initial negative trial. Um, it was a large study in Japan. They looked at the trial and there was a signal in a certain subset of patients um, and they redesigned a second clinical trial with very specific inclusion criteria of less than two years duration, independent living status, and normal respiratory function. And you can see here that the endpoint um, reads differently. So this transition here between Rilazole and Adaravone represents a transition 
from a research practice standpoint, and that is essentially how clinical trials are designed. And um, it's been come to, we've come to know that using endpoints like the ALS FRS score um, are much easier to study. They're, the signal is able to be detected earlier than looking at things like mortality. Um, but this is going to be the most common endpoint that you'll see is, is rate of decline of ALS FRS score. Um, and as you can see here, the, 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 the patients who received Radicava had a five-point decrease over this period as opposed to the patients who received placebo, which was 7.5. This same endpoint was used for the more recent study that resulted in an FDA approval for Relivrio. Um, but you can see here that the change is not dramatic. Um, a negative 1.24 point versus negative 1.66 point um, drop um, at 24 weeks. And secondary outcomes were not statistically significantly different. There is a larger confirmatory trial that's underway. Um, which will be very interesting to see. Um, and ultimately, this led to an FDA approval um, for this drug. Um, finally, tofersin or calsodi is the most recently approved drug um, for ALS. And this is specifically approved for familial ALS with pathogenic SOD1 variants. The endpoint was really looking at a biomarker standpoint, from a biomarker standpoint, so we reduced the concentration of SOD1 in the CSF and neurofilament light chains in the plasma, um, which is a very useful biomarker that's emerged to follow an ALS. But notably, it did not improve clinical endpoints associated with adverse events in, in some patients. Um, these patients are continued to be following, and there's more research being done on this, and more research in general on antisense oligonucleotides in SOD1 ALS and in other forms of familial ALS. Um, but this is an intrathecal in, in injection that is FDA approved at this point for a a SOD1 ALS. So this is my final slide, um, which is rather kind of busy, um, and I won't go through it in you know inordinate detail. But essentially, the the point of this slide is that it's likely the case that we would need to target multiple mechanisms. And the ultimate kind of effective therapy or even cure, hopefully, um, may be a kind of multi-target approach, um, much like multi-drug resistant infections or cancer. It may be that there's a cocktail of medications that will be you know, effective in treating this disorder. But, uh, there's, as you can see here, this is glutamate toxicity, as you mentioned, which, you know, rilazole targets, which is in clinical use. Idarivone targets oxidative stress, also in clinical use. And then AMX0035, that is Relivrio, um, which targets mitochondrial function. But some of these different domains are going to be discussed in further detail later, but you can see that there's a lot of research looking at various mechanisms in different areas or parts of the, the nervous system. This is looking at muscle. We see genetic therapies up here. We'll hear about this a little bit later today. And then looking at neuroinflammation. Um, so my hope um, is that this has kind of laid a groundwork for better understanding of the, the future talks today um, about kind of current, more up-to-date ALS research. Um, and you know, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilkes. Really appreciate your talk. Um, next up, I'm honored to introduce a longtime friend of ALS Northwest, Dr. Nicholas Olney. Dr. Olney is the clinical director of the Providence ALS Center here in Portland. Dr. Olney received his medical degree at the University of California, San Francisco, and completed his neurology residency at the University of California, Los Angeles. Following his residency, he returned to UCSF to focus on neurodegenerative disease and research prior to joining the ALS Center here in Portland. 
Dr. Olney has a unique perspective into his work with ALS patients, having been a primary caregiver for his own father who lived with ALS. Welcome, Dr. Olney. Thanks for being here. This, oh, this, all right. Hello, I'm Dr. Nick Olney. Thanks for uh, inviting me to talk. Um, I am the uh, director of the Providence ALS Center and Clinical Trials. Uh, here's a picture taken at Black Butte, uh, which was my dad's favorite place to vacation, uh, both before he had ALS and during ALS. And um, I also like to always tell the story that Lance was actually the person that would always deliver our equipment uh, to the cabin so we could get the wheelchair into the cabin. Here's a picture of my dad, uh, Rick Olney, who, uh, here's a picture of me as a caregiver uh, back when I was taking care of my dad. Um, but I do think seeing the devastating symptoms of ALS firsthand is what got me interested in learning more about ALS. Uh, throughout my training, I kept going back to learning as much as I could about ALS and ALS research. Eventually, that led me here to Providence to uh, be a part of clinical trials, because I really wanted to be a part of the winning team that could find effective treatments and potentially a cure. Thank you, thank you. Uh, here are my disclosures. So I have participated in the Avenir Visiting Expert Program for my work in pseudobulbar affect and ALS. I'm also a PI for multiple clinical trials as listed here. Um, I would also say that, uh, you know, a lot of my, the talk today, uh, just to kind of give a quick disclaimer, is that the field is moving quick. So this is valid as of you know, November 2023. And I really am kind of trying to prevent, present kind of a greatest hit, so to speak. So I'm kind of trying to present this also to a general audience. So slow me down if I'm going too fast, but I'm gonna to try to split the difference and, and ride that line. So basically, uh, I'm gonna give a quick clinical trials 101, and this is a lot about how I talk about it with my patients. So I think of the clinical trials traditionally as three trial, three different phases. Phase one is typically when it's first time in humans. So it's passed a lot of the animal safety data, but this is really the first time it's been in humans, usually 50 to 100 people. Those are typically not coming to the Northwest. Phase two then is typically, traditionally has been two different dosages where we pull a lot of safety data, but we also, that might, we, we might get a signal is there's something that's going on here clinically. And then phase three is the trials where you hear about both um, the randomized to drug versus placebo. And that's what the FDA requires to get a, a drug FDA approved. And, we're there, and we have some unique designs coming out now, so I'll try to explain those also and highlight those as we go through this. So I do think, uh, I have a lot of patients that come to me asking specifically for trials, but the first thing I always tell them is make sure you establish care at a team center. I think that's also been shown to uh, be helpful for both quality of life and slowing down progression with the correct interventions put in at the right time. I also think it's uh, always important that people review the FDA-approved treatments. You want to know, you want to have the FDA-approved treatment stable 30 days before screening for any trial. So Anson did a great job already uh, covering a lot of this, so I can probably go pretty quick, but I'll try to show you some of the graphs that this uh, data comes from. So really a tech. Uh, th this is the very first uh, drug that came out in New England Journal of Medicine, 1994. Uh, here's the initial graphs of that. Um, basically, uh, if you see on the left, that's all patients, and it showed a survival graph that 57 patients of 77 on the Riliotech were living longer at one year than patients uh, not, that was 45 versus 78 on placebo. They also broke it down by bulbar and, uh, and by limb onset there. Oh, sorry, the top graphs are, uh, the, the top is the uh, patients on drug and the lower uh, line is not on placebo. Uh, and then they went on to a dosing uh, range study. Uh, this is presented in Lancet in 1996. And so if you look at, um, they basically had 959 patients on placebo, 50 milligrams of Riliotech, 100 or 200. And that middle um, graph is the top line is the patients on Riliotech, which showed the best risk benefit ratio. And that's how we came up with the 50 milligrams twice a day, which is currently used. And the main thing to look at the risk being the liver side effects. Um, and then since then, we've come up with the ALS functional rating scale. Uh, this is a 48-point scale that looks at, captures different regions of the diseases, uh, uh, that, that AL, uh, the regions that ALS affects. So bulbar, upper limbs, lower limbs, and respiratory symptoms. 
And I think one of the groups that used this uh, the best was the Radhakava. So again, they had that big group that they, it was hard to show a difference, but then they enriched for uh, the group that looked like it was responding, and they showed this 30% difference uh, at six months using the ALS-FRS. And then I also like to look at this study that Dr. Scheffner and Steve Apple did. Uh, really, uh, when you look at the group here, so the top group is the group, uh, the top line is the group that got uh, Radhakava. However, in the middle, that's when the placebo started to get the drug. And I think if you zoom in closer, you do see that there's a bit of a rescue effect where patients are starting to have some effect being on the drug. Um, also, they do have oral Radhakava out now. Um, I went through many, sat through many lectures seeing, but basically the oral and the IV look very similar. These are two lines of them almost on top of each other. Uh, this is kind of the bioavailability of the drug. Um, so uh, I, I do think that this is a step forward. I think the challenge is just getting this out of, uh, getting it from insurance. And then the next drug that came out, Relivrio, so Amelix, and I still like the initial name AMX0035, uh, but uh, uh, so it showed both a change in uh, function at six months using the ALS-FRS as well as a survival benefit. And this is just based on one uh, phase two pivotal trial, the Centaur study, and you can see uh, Sabrina Paganini give more talks about it online, but they showed a 2.32 point change in the ALS-FRS as well as 6.5 month survival and then with a lot of patient advocacy, and it does have a very good uh, uh, side effect profile with about a fifth of people having GI symptoms that are recognized uh, pretty quickly. Um, so uh, I think, it, I think it, it makes sense. I certainly wrote a lot of uh, letters to advocate for this. Um, and this is the basic survival graph that this data comes from. So the red line is patients on Relivrio, and the blue line are for patients that uh, were the placebo, and so this is where they get that uh, six months benefit. So then the newest treatment, uh, Quisaldi, genetic treatment. So again, uh, you, it has to have uh, SOD1 positive. Uh, that's only 2% of all overall ALS. You wanna make sure you have that because it is monthly interthecal injections and has very good data, which I'll present at the end because we were a part of the Valor trial. However, in the last year, I was able to be a part of the ALS Genetic Testing and Counseling Guideline Expert Panel, and it is recommended now with this treatment that, you, that anyone diagnosed with ALS should at least be considered, uh, consider genetic testing. And they're becoming much more available as well. So then going back to uh, the specific kind of clinical trials, I'll tell you about previous trials that we've done here at Providence, as well as current trials that are open. So one of the recent my, my screen went out up here. Yeah, the monitor went down up here. Um, but anyway, uh, sorry about that. Uh, so I have to look up here to see my slides, sorry. Oop, oop. So this is AT1501, was a phase two clinical trial. Uh, everyone got drug, it was a dose escalation study. Um, basically, uh, as the, as each group had a, had a tested safety, and as it looked safe, they would go on to a higher dose. Uh, results are still pending, but basically the safety has been uh, qu uh, quite good. Thank you, the screen is back up. Courage ALS was a traditional phase three with drug and placebo. Uh, unfortunately, it was stuck, shut down to futility. So unfortunately, they did an early analysis that looked like it was not gonna meet its endpoint, but it was becoming a very popular trial at my site. It was more of a muscle-based mechanism. Thank you. Uh, so one of the current trials we have open is one of those unique phase two trials, uh, Cardinals. It's a phase two randomized double-blind double placebo-controlled parallel study to assess the efficacy, safety, tolerability, PK, and biomarker effects of PTC-857 in ALS. Uh, it's using the drug PTC-857, which inhibits uh, 15 lipooxygenase, uh, which is elevated in oxidative stress in neurodegenerative conditions like ALS. Um, it's supported by many ferropoptosis models. Um, to, to qualify for this uh, clinical trial, patients have to screen within 24 months of the first symptoms. Uh, the breathing has to be above 60%. Um, you're allowed to be on Reliatech and one of the new therapies. It does have an eight-week screening uh, cycle, um, but basically as long as people have screened and they don't have any safety profile problems, um, they will definitely get drug. Um, and then it has a 24-week double-blind time where people are randomized two to one for drug and a 28-week open label. It is international. Uh, I do think they'll probably get a lot of patients internationally because there's less challenges uh, with the new drugs. 
and uh, the enrollment is competitive. And then we are a big Healy platform trial site. Uh, it's been a very popular trial. Um, here on the left is the drug companies. Uh, the middle is the actual name of the drugs. And then the right is the mechanism. Um, so this is, I think I would say, is kind of a unique phase two trial design, which I'll talk about for a few minutes to set it up. So if you think of a traditional trial, we set up a big stadium, we run the race for about one to two years, we shut the trial down and then analyze the data. The platform trial, we're making a big stadium, we're running multiple races or trying multiple mechanisms uh, or drugs um, at the same time, and, uh, and it stays perpetually open. Some of the advantages of this is that, that you get randomized, there's more of a chance of being on drug, so a three or four chance of being on drug, um, and it pools the placebo as shown here on the left. This also cuts, cuts cost in a third and cuts time to get results by in half. To qualify for the trial, you do have to screen uh, within 36 months of symptoms, and breathing has to be above 50% as the basic criteria. Uh, then people are randomized for six months to uh, drug or placebo, three to four. And then there's an open label extension that is actually six months or longer. Basically, they've announced until we have an answer for that specific regimen. Uh, they're using primary endpoints of the ALS functional rating scale, uh, also breathing, handheld dynamometry, survival, specific biomarkers, um, exploratory endpoints, as well as safety endpoints. And uh, it actually is out of Harvard, so you can contribute to the, um, the Harvard uh, biorepository, as well as they have some um, exciting kind of speech digital biomarkers that they came up with in the pandemic. So I've actually been using this slide for quite a few years since I got to my job here in uh, 2018 and talking about this. So I'm excited that we're actually expanding now into seven regiments. So here kind of gives the timeline of how we're increasing uh, the regiments. And I will just give a brief update on the success of the regiments so far. So uh, Regimen A, um, unfortunately, was shut down to futility. The Regimen B was uh, finished the trial but was a negative trial. Uh, we had some uh, good results, uh, good phase two results from regimens C and D that have both, that I'll go into in just a second, and both have announced uh, moving on to phase three as well as expanded access programs. Uh, regimen E is now uh, fully enrolled and we're basically just waiting for that data and I talked a lot about it last year, so I'm gonna uh, not talk about it too much this year. And regimen F and G is actively enrolling, which I'll talk about in just a minute. So to give a quick update on regimen C, uh, it is an NAD catalyst and, uh, and focusing on the mechanism of ATP production. They use two dosages of 30 and 60 milligrams. Uh, they had 120 people pooled on drug and 164 with shared placebo. Uh, the ALS-FRS was not significant at six months, but the drug safety profile was very safe. Uh, they did have a reduction in time to clinical events like feeding tube, trach, death, or death equivalent in the 30 milligram group, and they're planning to move forward as to a, with that as the target dose and into a phase three trial. Uh, we opened an expanded access program at Providence and it filled very fast. We had 10 spots and it probably filled in a matter of weeks. For um, regimen D, uh, predopidine, it is a sigma-1 receptor agonist. It's predicted to reduce cellular stress, inflammation, and enhance clearance of toxic proteins. There's 120 patients on drug. Uh, the dosing was 45 milligrams twice a day, and the pool of placebo was 164. Uh, there's no difference in the ALS-FRS, but there was a signal in the exploratory endpoints in the speech measures, as well as the subgroup analysis in the ALS-FRS. So here in the exploratory endpoints of the speech function, compared to placebo, patients on the predopidine had less changes in speaking rate, articulation rate, phonation time, and articulation precision. In the subgroup analysis, there's a trend of stronger effects in, the, in patients starting the drugs within 18 months of symptoms, as well as those with a clinical diagnosis of definite ALS. So uh, th this also is, a, uh, these graphs are a little bit interesting to explain. So the, the, basically the bigger the graph is the the bigger the change between the placebo, so more stability. So the left side would be everyone versus placebo. Uh, the middle is uh, patients who started uh, within less than 18 months of symptom onset, and then that one on the right is combining definite ALS and uh, less than 18 months. We saw a similar trend also in the subscores of Bulbar, subscores on the ALS-FRS, as well as 
the respiratory scores, which I'm not showing today. There's also a post hoc analysis um, or a later analysis that showed reduction in neurofilament in the fast progressing participants. So, um, and that's shown here again, so the bigger is actually better here. Uh, so the Perlinia has announced expanded access uh, and, and plans to move on to phase three. This was just announced a month ago. I'm not sure if we're chosen yet, but we certainly, certainly threw our hat in the ring and hope we do get chosen to be a part of the expanded access and hopefully the phase three as well. And so the new current uh, regimens that are actively recruiting for Healy are regimens F and G. Uh, regimen F is through a collaboration of Calico AbbVie and regimen G being Denali. And they're both actually targeting the same integrated stress response. And I actually found a pretty nice uh, video that would have taken me like five years to animate on my own PowerPoint. So I have the video if we could show that. ALS, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, is a progressive disease caused by degeneration of the motor neurons. Located in the brain and spinal cord, these motor neurons communicate with our muscles, controlling their movement. When no longer stimulated, muscles progressively weaken. First, gripping objects becomes hard. Eventually, patients lose the ability to speak, eat, move, and finally breathe. Deterioration is rapid. Most patients die within three to five years of diagnosis. ALS affects approximately 30,000 people in the US and an estimated 500,000 people worldwide. 10% of cases are hereditary. There is no known cure and only a few approved medications in the US and Canada available for treatment of the disease. Calico Life Sciences has been researching the Integrated Stress Response, ISR, and its relationship with TDP43, a protein found in the pathology of the majority of ALS cases. Hardwired in all cells, the ISR is a reversible signaling pathway that allows our body to cope during times of cellular stress. When switched on by a variety of stressors, this coping mechanism stops the translation of mRNA into essential proteins by inhibiting the EIF2B complex. The stressors also trigger the formation of stress granules, which trap the untranslated mRNA and TDP43. In normal functioning cells, this coping mechanism is short-lived. However, if the ISR stays on for a very long time, the cells unable to produce essential proteins and stress granules continue to form. It is thought TDP43 in stress granules leads to insoluble TDP43 aggregates, which are a hallmark of ALS. Our hypothesis is, at that point, the cell is overwhelmed, it shuts down, and the neuron dies. Based on this research, Calico, in collaboration with AbbVie, is investigating a novel therapy that directly activates EIF2B, which we hypothesize will return the cell to normal function, preventing neuronal death. It is our hope that this novel approach may help patients with ALS. to the slides, all right, thank you. I just thought that was a cool video, a very quick two minute summary of that mechanism, lots of cool animation there. So that's what, uh, the, that's the mechanism, that was the Calico version, this is actually the one online that Denali has on their website, but that they're both targeting the same uh, mechanism I think is very exciting, and also how close it is to that TDP pathology that uh, Dr. Wilkes presented, um, I think is also very exciting. Um, also, there is a biomarker for that EIF2B in the spinal fluid, so I think at this point, I'm, I should also mention that it is becoming more and more uh, meaningful and important that we collect spinal fluid in clinical trials, and that is, really is kind of one of the directions that um, a lot of the ALS research is going, because the science has kind of finally got there, as I'm sure you're going to hear more uh, later in the talks. Um, that we can do a lot with it. Um, so all three of the trials currently are asking for LPs. Um, actually, Regimen F and Cardinals, are, it's about part of the protocol. Regimen G, it's optional. Uh, all research is optional, but they are hoping to get 30% participation, and they may require it later. Um, so then I also think at this point, as we mentioned LPs, I'll talk a little bit more about the ALS genetic therapies. Uh, Dr. Wilkes covered this briefly, but... Uh, just to recap, 10% of ALS is genetic, 2% is SOD1. And um, when we have genetic mutations, there's either loss of function or gain of toxicity. We have mounting, more mounting evidence that SOD1 really has a gain of toxicity, and this is a bad protein to have a mutation in that causes ALS. So what we're trying to do is actually silence that or prevent the protein from being formed. 
So again, to kind of walk through that mechanism here, we have the DNA in the cell on the left that makes RNA, which is that blue strand. And if, if naturally, it would go to um, the ribosome and make a protein. So what the antisense oligonucleotide is, is the red strand, which is a mirror image that binds that blue mRNA to prevent it from ever making that bad or toxic protein. And so this is where I often mentioned uh, my, uh, my friend Tim Miller. So um, just a per bit of a personal connection is that my uh, dad actually uh, trained Tim Miller and I actually got to shadow him uh, while he was working early on this technology in Don Cleveland's lab at um, UCSD. And so I've been following the story for about 20 years. So it was very exciting to be uh, participating in the Valor study. And Tim is really one of the main neurologists kind of talking about this technology, although there's lots of people involved. So Don Cleveland at UCSD, Toby Ferguson at Biogen, and uh, I just always like to show a picture of Tim Miller but, um, and talk about my personal connection. <laughs> so, uh, but we were lucky enough to be a part of the Valor study. So again, this is an S SOD1, antisense oligonucleotide tofircin. It was a phase three trial recruiting slow and rapid progressors with that interthecal delivery. So that's giving a lumbar puncture and having to give the drug over a two minute push. Um, the data came out um, in this New England Journal of Medicine article. I think this is a rather pivotal article that I'll go over briefly. So uh, the groups were well balanced for the usage of Riliotech and Radicava at the time. It was 108 patients, 72 got Tofircin, and the placebo is 36. Uh, there's a total of 60 fast progressors and 48 slow progressors. Um, I'm presenting, uh, or I'm showing the 52 weeks of data that was presented in the New England Journal of Medicine, and how this was broken down is that the red lines are patients who got early start to Fearson, so they got it from day one, and the blue line is patients who did not get it until 28 weeks, which would be the open label section. So what this graph is showing is the uh, target engagement with SOD1, so lowering that um, bad protein in the spinal fluid. So you can see at 12 weeks, the red line is already going down and it stays down, as well as once patients uh, about 12 weeks after they get the drug and the blue line also start to go down and it stays down. So I think this is showing good target engagement. We also see a similar trend in the neurofilament. So the red line, the early start to Fearson, uh, shows the, the, the neurofilament going down. And again, neurofilament being a surrogate for neuron death. So going down is a good thing and uh, also supports target engagement. And we see a similar trend in the blue line of patients who get it later. I think the other thing that um, we see is that although the ALS functional rating scale was not significant at six weeks, it does suggest maybe this trial should have been longer because we do start seeing more stabilization and more separation of those curves as time goes on. So again, the red being patients who got the Tofircin early and the blue who got it later. We also see a similar trend here when we look at the uh, slow vital capacity of the breathing numbers, um, where again, more stability after we get into that ex open label extension period after 28 weeks. Also very similar in the motor function, which is represented by the handheld dynametry. Um, we also, when we do plot a survival curve, again, patients in, in the red who got the, the uh, drug earlier uh, had a better survival than blue who started later. And the main side effects, uh, were equal between the placebo and the tofircin. Unfortunately, a lot of it due to the lumbar punctures, uh, the pain procedure, the headache, about 30% of patients with it get a lumbar puncture could get a headache. I would say though this is different than those other lumbar punctures I talked about earlier, because those are only every six months. These are uh, monthly lumbar punctures, and even the loading dose you have to do every two weeks. So it's a, it's a pretty intense amount of lumbar punctures, but I think there's a lot to gain from this therapy. So in summary, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine article here summarizing Valor, uh, it had good target engagement with the SOD1 and the neurofilament data. Uh, the 28 weeks did not show significant clinical endpoints, but there is that signal of with more time and delayed initiation um, that, that there was some benefit. So, so after, much, uh, after more time in that open label and uh, patient advocacy, uh, that actually is an FDA approved treatment and we've actually been starting to do it here at Providence. Um, and I actually have another video that I wanna show very quickly. The FDA recently approved what could be a groundbreaking treatment for ALS. And today a man from Hood River living with the disease became the first person in the country to receive the new drug. Fox 12's Paulina Aguilar was there for the whole procedure. She joins us live now from Northeast Portland with his story. 
Yes, Terry Smith is officially the first person to receive this injection. And I spoke to him before and after the procedure. He was in great spirits the whole time. He was very calm. And of course, he was a little scared because this medicine is so brand new. But he told me that this is just a positive step in the right direction. Terry was diagnosed with ALS in November 2021. This is hard to maneuver around. My walking has decreased quite a bit. You see people just walking now and stuff, and you kind of envy that. Terry is part of the 10% of those with ALS with a specific genetic component, and he's part of the 2% that have a specific gene mutation, making him qualified to receive the very first injection of Calsati, a medicine that could slow down the progression of ALS. It's more positive to me than a negative. You know, I just, I'm just ready to do this and and make the most of it. You will feel a little, a little sting with this, okay? First, they must take out the spinal fluid to prevent any headaches later on. All right, Terry, it's happening. Then inject the medicine. As you inject it into the spinal um, column and then the SOD1 protein, it stops the production of that um, so that it decreases the amount of that in the spinal fluid. Oh, good, oh, good. Oh, it's amazing. It's just, uh, I feel so honored, really, you know. I, I know there's been a lot of test trials that have gone on to get to this point. And Providence hopes to see a positive change in his next checkup. If we were to look at the spinal fluid itself, we would see that the SOD1 protein and the neurofilament concentration were both lower. Though there is no cure for ALS, this is a step in the right direction. Well, I really have faith in, in the science of it at all. And I'm willing to take that chance to see what happens. And this medicine will buy him more time with his family. I have an RV that I've been traveling around in and stuff, because I'm not gonna allow a ALS to stop my life. What are some of your summer plans for next year, your bucket lists? Um, hopefully go up to Alaska would be a great, a great bucket list, I think. Providence tells me that they expect more people to receive this injection later this year. Reporting in Northeast Portland, Paulina Aguilar, Fox 12, Oregon. So I like that news clip, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, we were able to get the first patient on and I have to actually give full credit to Lauren Brown, the nurse practitioner in my clinic who's sitting over here. She's an amazing colleague to work with and just put a lot of extra effort in and we're really starting to take, um, you know, I mean, she's actually really heading up the program and doing the lumbar punctures all the time. And also you can see my other partner, Dr. Baz my clinical partner, Dr. Bazan, doing the lumbar puncture in that news clip. So we really try to take a team approach here at, uh, at Providence. I think that's the end, but, um, but then, uh, actually, can you, the monitor went off again, sorry. Um, but I do think this is an exciting time to be in ALS research. Um, I think especially with the genetic treatments, all these other things coming in the pipeline, we have even things we're really waiting for results on. Um, and I'd also like to say that I think, you know, um, uh, also, uh, you know, I think we might be in the early stages, just like in the time of the HIV field, when you had one compound, it maybe, maybe didn't make as much of a difference, but when you start getting a cocktail and you really start getting these targeted therapies, that actually can make a significant difference. So I really do hope and uh, think in my lifetime that we have a good chance of actually finding effective treatments for ALS and hopefully a cure. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Olney, and what an inspiring video of Terry Smith. Thanks for showing that. Um, at this point, we do have some staff members who are coming around to collect any questions that folks have. Um, feel free to give that to a few of the people who are wandering around. Um, next, I am very excited to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Robert Bowser. Dr. Bowser is an internationally recognized leader in ALS research contributing pioneering efforts to discover and validate biomarkers for ALS and other neurodegenerative diseases. These biomarkers have been instrumental as diagnostic biomarkers of disease and predictors of disease progression. As Deputy Chief Scientific Officer of Barrow Neurological Institute and St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center, Dr. Bowser oversees all research efforts and defines research directions for the Institute. Dr. Bowser is also the co-director of a national biorepository of biofluid samples from ALS patients 
and of National ALS Postmortem Tissue Bank. Dr. Bowser obtained his undergraduate degree from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh and PhD from Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. He completed his fellowship training at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York City and was a faculty member at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine from 1994 to 2011, rising through the ranks to a full professor. Give me a warm welcome for Dr. Bowser. Thanks, Cassie. Uh, just want to thank the organizers the, for the invitation here and the opportunity to speak with you today. So today I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing for a number of years. So as we mentioned, I've been in this about 30 years for ALS and looking at biomarkers early on before, before it was in vogue, um, trying to convince people that this is the path forward. I'm going to give a quick overview of some of the areas of research in my lab in general and then touch on uses of biomarkers and actually a couple of trials you've heard about already, so that's kind of good, repetition is good. And then some newer data that we've had ongoing in a few different directions. And then an exciting new uh, project that, that's just being launched right now that, that I'm really excited about. So my, here are my disclosures. Um, none of it really incredibly relevant for this particular talk though. So again, some of the overview of activities in my lab. So I have um, almost 20 members of my group, um, a number of which that work in the preclinical area and then a separate group in the clinical area. And so on the preclinical side, as was mentioned, and Cassie actually direct a couple of national biorepositories for ALS, some that are postmortem tissue banking and others that are collecting biofluids in a longitudinal manner, manner from ALS patients and controls. And both of those are currently funded by a group called Target ALS. And for years, I've been looking at biomarkers of the disease, and I'll get into why in a few slides, but looking and discovering biomarkers for ALS patients and validating these so we can try to move them into a more clinical arena. And later on, I'll show you some data of actually trying to look at what's different between people that progress quickly versus slowly with ALS. And how might that play a role in how we modify or, or introduce treatments? And then again, incorporating these into trials. I'm going to show a slide or two. We have a group that works on barriers of the brain. What happens to the blood brain barrier or the blood CSF barrier in patients with ALS? Are these new targets for, for drugs and new, new ways to introduce treatments into patients? We've created a number of novel mouse models of the disease. Obviously, we've got to create these types of models so we can test things um, preclinically before we bring them to, to, to humans. We grow a lot of cells from patients in control. So these are called induced pluripotent stem cells. And from that, they're on the left, sort of that mish and mish, mishmash of cells that are all growing together. We can induce them to become either cortical neurons, um, motor neurons, other types of cells called glia from within the nervous system so that we can look and measure and, and test these um, in tissue culture. So in, in plates, petri dishes within the lab. We also look at, at novel ways for therapeutic development. Um, so another member of my group has been working on nanoparticles to deliver drugs that can't cross the blood brain barrier. So most drugs that you'd like to, to take actually can't get across the barriers into the central nervous system. And so how can we allow those drugs to get across? And so we've taken you know, one particular drug of interest that we had great success on in our cultured cell models and then put that inside of these nanoparticles and then could tr treat one of the mouse models of the disease and show that sure enough, just as we predicted, it protected neuromuscular junctions, it protect protected motor neurons from dying. So again, these are ways and paths that now we're trying to move these drugs into clinical development. Another group, and actually one of the companies, so I've started three different companies in this area, but one of the companies I started is looking at novel approaches for gene therapy. So that's been mentioned once or twice, but now we're, we're making specific vectors designed to only target cells of interest within the central nervous system. And so we think that'll avoid some of the nasty side effects that can happen in gene therapy. 
And this is just one picture down on the bottom there looking at cells that we've created a vector that only targets a specific cell type of the nervous system called glia cells, and we're modulating inflammation using these vectors. So we can tune down inflammation. We think this is a path forward for ALS. And then also a number of clinical research studies and trials. And this is just highlighting again this sort of biofluids, longitudinal biofluids collection with a lot of at-home measures of patients and controls using speech analytics, respiratory measures at home. And again, this is a program funded by Target ALS. Uh, we're collecting all this information so that we can look at sort of the natural history of the disease and collect fluids that we can do research on and then share those fluids with scientists around the world. So what we've known for many years, obviously there's tremendous challenges in finding improved and effective drugs for ALS. And the big thing was, you know, our animal models often don't predict what happens in humans with the disease. And really, that's, that started me on a biomarker path about 30 years ago. So we were struggling and we couldn't get, we could cure the mouse many times, but then when we took that drug to humans, it failed. And so looking back, you know, years ago, I said, if that model doesn't predict what's happening in humans, then the heck with the model. You know, I'm more interested in, in treating patients, not treating the mice. And so let's study humans. And the only way to do that was to collect biofluids, collect postmortem tissues. They can actually look and see what's different in somebody with this disease. Are the pathways that we study in our animal model, are they impacted in patients? Again, we must have postmortem tissues to actually look and say, is this pathway actually impacted by somebody with this disease? It's the only way to do it. And you've heard a little bit, we know it's a very heterogeneous disease. We know over 40 genes that are implicated in ALS, and that number continues to grow. There are lots of different cell types in the nervous system and a lot of different signaling pathways. You saw the one um, slide at the end of Dr. Wilk's study, everything seems to be impacted. And we know that patients exhibit variable rates of disease progression. What is that trying to tell us? I always thought, again, biomarkers could address these challenges. So what is a biomarker? Again, I was doing this before it was sort of in void. Now it's actually in the lexicon. I think most people know. Uh, it's really anything that you can detect and measure in a body, uh, in a tissue, in a biofluid, that is a sign of something that's abnormal from um, a particular disease or a condition. It could provide information about the course of the disease, about the response of a treatment in that individual. And great examples are very easy things that everyone's well aware of. Your blood pressure, uh, glucose uh, levels in the blood if you're a diabetic. Gene mutations are also a biomarker. It's actually identifying a specific form of the disease caused by a genetic variant. So here's just a, a, a quick snapshot of, again, over 40 genes implicated in ALS. And, what, and this is on a timeline. So the, the left side, um, starting back with SOD1 mutations that were first discovered back at around 94, and now up to, you know, in 2023, we have over 40 genes. And you can see that there's a great acceleration as we move forward in time. There's a lot of reasons for that. Some are just the methodologies, technologies of sequencing genes got much better. And then also there's a lot more interest in this disease in the last 10 to 15 years, which has accelerated the research. And again, uh, as was mentioned by Dr. Olney, it's really an exciting time to be in ALS. Again, one of the problems is this heterogeneous disease population. So what, what's done? to sort of in clinical trials arenas to create a more homogeneous patient population. So right now we use clinical parameters, and these have already been mentioned in some of the studies that, that were indicated. And so you're, you're identifying those with maybe um, definite ALS, shortly from the symptom onset, and those are the individuals that are getting enrolled in most clinical trials. And why is that? Most likely than not, those are fast progressors. In the Healy platform studies and many trials in, in the U.S., companies want to do this in six months. We want to signal in six months. Well, if you enroll half your patients in a drug trial that are slow progressors, they're not going to change in six months. You have no way to know if your drug has any impact. And so you must 
you must try to enroll people with fast progression. So the clinical parameters are currently used to do that. You could look at, as was mentioned, specific genetic forms of the disease and then come up with treatments that are targeted to those individuals. And we've already heard a little bit about a couple of those. Um, one is the ASOs for SOD1. Or you could look at biochemical markers and have a drug that targets a pathway and then only treat patients that have a change in that pathway and see if you can modify it. So a few years back, I ran a phase two trial looking at a drug that targets IL-6 signaling. And it's inflammation, and so everyone has inflammation. But if you look in ALS patients, only around 45% have elevated IL-6. And so we first had to screen patients. We were doing this at eight sites in the US, screen patients for those that had elevated IL-6. And you only enrolled patients that had elevated IL-6. We provided them the drug. And then over the course of the next six months looked, could we modulate ILS, IL-6 signaling in those patients? And sure enough, we did. It was too short of a trial to see whether or not it was benefit. But we know enough that we could take this drug into a much larger trial now, and we know the patient population to treat. So I've mentioned biomarkers to monitor, to, or, or to look at um, ALS disease progression and potentially treatment responses. And again, some of these have been measured, looking at the changes in that ALS FRS, the functional rating scale, and looking at that delta. Have we modified that delta? You can look at respiratory measures and strength measures as well. Upcoming, I think we'll see more and more are sort of these at-home measures. And there's been a lot of work looking at specific uh, digital or at-home measures, especially speech. Speech, we can see changes in ALS patients very early, even before um, the patient, the care providers can see changes in the person's speech. And we can see that and we can monitor that over time. We have really good data now showing that as speech changes, the disease is progressing in that individual. And then we have these biochemical markers, which have been mentioned now, looking at neurofilament light chain, which is one of the big ones in inflammatory um, proteins. So the neurofilament proteins, you've heard this now in a couple of, our, uh, of the talks. So these are proteins, they're made in neurons. They're only made in neurons in the body. And so if you, you can measure that in the biofluids that surround the nervous system and within the periphery. And so we have great assays that can measure this protein and we can detect it in cerebral spinal fluid or blood. And so I was doing these studies 20, 30 years ago and could see differences in ALS and trying to say, hey, we should be doing this in our clinical trials early on and watching for changes. Probably took about a decade before people caught on and said, yes, this is probably a good thing to try. We and other labs around the world could show that, yep, there's a good correlation between this release of neurofilament, which is most abundant in the axons of a nerve, and so it's a measure of the injury that occurs to an axon or to a neuron. And so you could correlate that level of axonal injury to clinical changes and clinical signs of progression within the patient. Interestingly enough, there's still a lot of underlying biology questions of how does the protein get there? How is it released? How does it get out into the blood? We can measure it in the blood. So it goes from the cerebral spinal fluid in the nervous system, gets drained out into the blood, exactly how we don't know how it gets turned over, how the body gets rid of it, what's the timeline of that? We don't really know that either. But it's a great biomarker that's in use and in vogue and everyone is thrown in in every single ALS clinical trial that's out there. This is just some data from a study that we did a few years ago in collaboration with Denali Therapeutics. In here, the only take home message, and I don't have a pointer, so the only take home message was um, sort of in the middle for these, looking at neurofilament proteins, and there's a couple forms of it um, that you can measure light or heavy chain, that if you look between sort of the slow and fast progressors, there's a difference. So you can take one snapshot in time of an individual and, show, and distinguish whether or not somebody is probably a slow or fast progressor. Now, it's not 100%. There's a lot of overlap. And so by itself, is it perfect? but it is giving you indications of whether or not the disease is likely going to move more quickly or slowly within somebody. So now a couple of, of the recent um, clinical trials that got a, a led to FDA approval, we've heard about both of them already. 
and actually the data for one, Dr. Olney's already showed the first uh, couple of my slides now from, from the Biogen data. So, oh no, it's perfect. Like again, repetition, people will remember this now, that, that's fantastic. So again, Tofersen um, is targeting SOD1. And so you, could, you brought up Tim Miller, and uh, you have known Tim Miller for, for decades now. And Tim, as you mentioned, was working in Don Cleveland's lab when they came up with this great idea of using this approach to sort of tune down SOD1 levels. And if it's mutated and causing disease, if you tune it down, presumably it should stop the disease. And I still remember when the day that Tim called me up, I was back in Pittsburgh then, and he called me up and said, you know, I've been working in biomarkers for, for a number of years by then. He's like, Bob, have you ever looked at SOD1 levels in the cerebral spinal fluid of people? I said, yeah, I have. And he goes, what happens over time? Do you know anything about does it change or not over time? And I said, no, I have the data and I'll send it to you. And it doesn't change over time. And that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Because one of the key things with any biomarker is that how does it normally change in people over time? If you're gonna use an, an antisense oligo to turn down SOD1, you need to know how it normally changes in somebody so you can, so you can guesstimate on how that projection should change upon treatment. And so if it doesn't change over time and you give the drug, you should see a drop. And here in the data, and as was mentioned already by Dr. Olney, it's exactly what they saw. So in the red, when you have treatment, you get this drop in SOD1. And then the blue, which really are patients that got placebo, and then entered the open label extension of the trial. Now they got drug, and now you get this drop in SOD1. So it's a perfect, what's called a pharmacodynamic biomarker. It's hitting, you know that the drug is hitting its target. This is another big problem with ALS trials and actually every other trial in neurodegenerative diseases, especially if, you know, if you're given a pill or you're given whatever to somebody, how do you know it got into the nervous system? How do you know it's actually doing what it should be doing? So this is great data showing that the drug got to where it needs to go and is turning down SOD1. And then when they looked at neurofilament, so again, at neurofilament, so I went to Biogen and showed them my data on neurofilament, and they quickly incorporated it within this trial. And so here again, um, the green here is patients that were getting a drug. Within 12 weeks, I got a drop of like 30, 40% neurofilament. By 28 weeks, it sort of went down almost 50% and stayed very constant. The placebo group, really no change, maybe up a little bit. And then in the open label extension, when they got the drug, it dropped. So this was fantastic data, not only for Biogen, but very convincing to the FDA that here's a treatment response biomarker. They could show that when they got the drug, you reduced, you hit its target, you lowered SOD1, and then a biomarker of axonal injury and damage also dropped. And this correlated with the clinical signs of, of uh, slowing of disease progression that Dr. Olney mentioned. And so, but the FDA viewed this as incredibly powerful data for support of, the, of, of this drug earlier this year. And again, even we knew some of this from some of the earlier um, phase two and early phase one trials of this drug. So we knew this for a few years ago, actually, but this is the first of the large trial. But everyone was jumping on board, let's lower neurofilament. Amelex, we've heard about that, another FDA-approved drug. And so working with, with that company a number of years ago, you know, I also said we should throw in neurofilament and see how and show that it changes neurofilament levels. Again, in this trial, you're mixing two drugs that individually actually don't work in patients, but now you're mixing two drugs. And I think, as Dr. Olney mentioned, we'll see more and more of this, that the combination of drugs that target different pathways are probably gonna be more and more effective in, in patients with ALS. And so again, they're looking at clinical measures of, of, um, of disease progression because these are the clinical measures are what the FDA wanna see for approval and then they looked at, at neurofilament levels. So as was shown early on, over the first 24 weeks of treatment, you, you get some change, uh, sort of a difference between those that got drug, which is the green here, and those that didn't in the blue, um, on the change in ALS FR, FRS over time. And then with the open label study, which is shown on the right here, 
again, now you're looking at survival in this graph. And again, you got this delta, you got this change in patients that got drug early on, even versus those that got it later on of about six and a half months. So there is an increase in survival, which is really a gold standard to the FDA for ALS treatments. And then in a, recently they published, um, looking again as they keep extending that further and further with open label extension of this drug, that if you looked at sort of a historical um, placebo control, which is the light blue here from the PROACT database, it looks like there's a 10 month increase in survival when compared um, to placebo group. So again, great data showing that there's an increase in survival with this drug combination. When we looked at, at neurofilament levels, and so we were measuring those in, in uh, my company, one of the companies that I have, um, I mean, everything was done in a blinded way. We gave the data back to the company, and then they contacted me and said, hey, it didn't change. Neurofilament doesn't change, but they only had data over that first 24 week. So they did not, in the open label extension, keep collecting blood. So all we knew was during the first six months, we did not see any change in neurofilament. Now they're doing, as was mentioned, a bigger and longer additional phase three trial, and they are collecting blood samples for longer periods of time. So we'll see if, in fact, this drug combination changes and reduces neurofilament if you look out longer and longer periods of time. But I'd also suggested, hey, let's look at some inflammatory biomarkers as well. And one of them that was interested, that I was interested in, and also had some impact by mechanism of action of this drug in the periphery was a protein called YKL40. So I had data longitudinally in patients. So these are four visits over the course of a year, collecting blood, looking at YKL40 levels. And there seems to be a modest increase over time in ALS patients. So when we looked at blood from those 24 week duration that we had from the trial, the placebo again sort of went up a little bit over time. And the patients that got drug either stayed the same or actually reduced a little bit, but it was significant even in those 24 weeks. So possibly this type of a peripheral inflammatory biomarker might be a signal that yes, they're getting a treatment response to their drug, even in the blood. So some summary of biomarker results from our trials. Again, neurofilament is thrown out in every trial. It's a great biomarker, I've been studying it for decades. In certain trials, it's worked fantastic. One that is spinal muscular atrophy, SMA. So again, kids getting this uh, ASO for a particular gene defect for SMA patients show marvelous improvement over time. And again, a second with tofersin and ALS, patients with SOD1 mutations. Two things here. These are great indications, but both of them are only in patients with a specific genetic form of the disease. So maybe it doesn't work really well in the general patient population, but really well in genetic forms of the disease. What level of neurofilament drops necessary to show a treatment response? We don't know. We will gain more data by including this in more and more trials. We'll get more information. But we currently don't exactly know. Do you need to reduce it 50%, 40%, 20%? We don't know. FDA wants us to gain that information and in that, in that data. And then some FDA-approved drugs actually didn't change neurofilament, like Revilio. Again, we'll know if it changes it in longer, uh, over longer periods of time in the next trial. So again, some disease-modifying agents might change neurofilament quickly, some not so. And so because of this, maybe not all trials should be in short duration, like the six-month trials that we typically do. We know that you know, and I've been harping this for decades, biomarkers should be included in all clinical trials. They should be used to create more homogeneous patient populations. No single biomarker is gonna provide the answer. Neurofilament's great. It's not gonna be the end all for ALS clinical trials. I, I like this, the term multimodal. It's thinking about multiple biomarkers across different pathways. That's what should be included in ALS clinical trials. There's lots of different biomarkers on the horizon. We're generating new and new assays for different, what I think are really interesting biomarkers, including TDP43 and looking for the loss of function of that. And I think that's a, a, the sort of the next step and on the horizon for, for ALS biomarkers. Now a, a quick little study looking at using these biofluids that we've been collecting in our research studies. And it was run by a, a postdoc at the time, Lucas Vu, 
And this paper just came out, I guess, two months ago or so. So we were using proteomics and mathematical modeling. And again, the question was, can we distinguish fast and slow progressors right from the get-go? And surprisingly, looking in the literature, there's very few studies that have asked that question specifically. And when I was doing it, I purposely only were, were um, selecting patients that were fast and slow for this study. And I had people pushing back and saying, you don't have any controls. And my response was, I don't care. My question is, what's different between somebody that's progressing rapidly and someone that's progressing slowly? That's the question. And so we took this approach and we used cerebral spinal fluid, longitudinal samples from people that were progressing fast versus slow. We use a technology called mass spectrometry. So we're trying to look at every protein that's present in the cerebral spinal fluid. When we do that and use lots of different algorithms, et cetera, really the take home message is, is here and it sort of uh, on the right is fast and the lowest and on the left is slow. And with the yellow, it, that gradation means there's more of it. And if it's blue, there's less of it. And so what you see, what we found was 59 proteins that were clearly different between somebody that was fast and somebody that was slow progressors. And most of them were up in the fast progressors. There's only a few that you can see that sort of flip in the slow where yellow is more on the slow and blue is on the fast. So not gonna go through some of uh, exactly what all these members do, but really then when we looked and did a pathway analysis, what do these proteins do? How do they function? So we found in fast progressors, there's a lot of immunity, things that are turned on and flipped up. Lipid metabolism, mentioned a, a drug that's in clinical trials now, is actually targeting some of this pathway. The blood-brain barrier, how blood coagulates was up in fast progressors. And interestingly, but actually what kind of makes sense, what was up in slow progressors that was actually down in fast progressors? These were pathways that are involved in synaptogenesis, that is, how neurons connect to one another. So in slow progressors, it's up. These, these, neuron, these neurons are trying to respond to a disease and make more and more connections and survive. The other thing that was up was how people utilize glucose and make energy. Those pathways were up in slow progressors versus fast. So then I got an idea, well, instead of looking at individual proteins, which we've done now for a long time, or pathways that I've shown you a few of, what about if we look at everything all at once? And sort of that's the methodology that I like to use. So the questions were, are global changes different between fast and slow progressors in the proteome, all the proteins in cerebral spinal fluid? I didn't know how to do that. I'm not a bioinformatics person, so I'm looking around for people to collaborate with. Looking in the literature, are anyone doing this? And not surprisingly, the oncology space is about a decade ahead of the neurodegenerative space. So I found this group of mathematicians and physicists out in California that were taking data sets like I generate, and they were using it in the oncology space, and they were trying to make predictions of who would have a tumor reoccurrence. So right at day one when the tumor was removed, could they predict who was gonna have a reoccurrence of that tumor? So I contacted them and said, hey, I don't work in your space, in, in this, I work in a different disease. I got this interesting data. Would you be interested in trying to create a mathematical model of, of fast versus slow? And they said yes. And so I sent them all the data. And I didn't hear from them for probably six months. So then I contacted them. I'm like, okay, what's going on? Are, are you gonna do this, yes or no? And you know, talking to the to the mathematician, he's like, yeah, okay, yes, we're doing this. We're, you know, we're on it. And about a month later, he sent me back the results. And so I figured he didn't do anything for six months. I finally hammered him enough, and then he finally decided to do something, and I got the data in a month. So he said, all right, I can predict who has fast and slow from your data set. And uh, make the long story short, just if you look at the, at the left, so the noisy thing on the fast progressors on the, on the upper left, this is the proteome from what I see by mass spectrometry of a fast progressor. And if you look on the bottom, slow progressors, and that's the same sort of mass spec proteome signature in what I'm looking at. And easily what you can see is there's a difference in basically noise, how noisy your proteome is. And that's what he came back with. He's like, we can create a mathematical model where we can take one time point, do mass spectrometry, 
And I can tell you if it's noisy or not noisy. And if it's noisy, you're a fast progressor. And somewhat biologically, it makes sense. If you're a fast progressor, there's a lot of things ongoing in your body. Things are responding. Cells are moving in from the periphery, immune cells. Lots of pathways are being activated. Your proteum's noisy. And if you're a slow progressor, not much is going on at any point in time. And since it was a, it was a mathematical model, we could swing it in different directions over time and ask questions. And so I said, all right, let's move it backwards in time. How early can you see this change? And again, what, what I'm showing here is that if you use the simulations backwards in time, we can see changes, noisy proteome, probably very early in somebody with ALS, if you're a fast progressor. So in, as we've heard, in clinical trials, we monitor clinical parameters of disease progression. FDA wants that. We look at neurofilament. We look at one or two neuroinflammatory proteins. We look at one or two things. Why not look at all of them at once? So the question is, will a disease-modifying treatment change that model from a noisy proteome to a quiet proteome, which would indicate you've changed somebody from a fast progressor to a slow progressor? So right now I'm working with Biogen to get CSF samples from patients that prior to tifosin and after they got the drug to see if this actually, the, my hypothesis is correct. So again, lots of proteomics from fast and slow, find proteins, find pathways that predict. Maybe treatments should be different if you're a fast or slow progressor. Maybe it's one reason why big phase three trials fail because we take all comers. Some are fast, some are slow. One other quick little vignette, two slides, almost done. I have time? Good. Use of tissue samples. So I've mentioned this once or twice. So uh, Nadine Bacar is another junior faculty member of my group, is very interested in exploring what's happening at the level of the barriers of our nervous system in somebody with ALS. And uh, she's been publishing a, a few papers looking at the Cori plexus. So this is an area that makes cerebral spinal fluid in your body. It's also an area where, where like cells, immune cells from the periphery from the blood can actually get into the central nervous system. And this is just one slide, and again, looking, I don't have a good, is this working? No, oh, it does, kinda. Can you actually see that little red dot? Not really. Um, the top is control, I'm not gonna use that. Um, the top is control and the bottom are ALS. The red is looking for this particular protein of interest that we're looking at, and you can sort of see it's night and day between controls and ALS. And this is indicative of a high level of inflammation that's occurring even at the level of a cord plexus. And we've been watching and can monitor glial cells as they're moving into the central nervous system through this area. And we're really excited about some of the possibilities, even on biomarkers in the blood that are being activated and turned on and released because of this happening in the cord plexus. In the last couple of seconds, again, a really exciting um, a consortium that's, that's just being initiated. It's called the All ALS Consortium. So this was just funded a month ago uh, by NIH and NDS using funding from the Act for ALS. So they, there are two coordinating centers in the country, and so the West Coordinating Center at Barrow is, is directed by myself, and then the Eastern Coordinating Center is at Mass General and being directed by James Berry. What we're trying to do, I'll get to in a moment. Our partners in crime are NINDS and NIH, the FNIH, which no one usually has ever heard of, which is the foundation for the NIH, and then another group called AMP ALS, which is a combination of industry, industry sponsors, different foundations that are involved in ALS, and people living with ALS. And that's a steering committee that are above us. And then I've listed some of the in other individual investigators below that are, that are uh, deeply involved. Again, one being Tim Miller from Washington. There we go. Tim's a common theme, I guess. We're initially going out to 34 sites. Um, again, it hasn't started yet. This is a month into funding. Um, and out of the west sites, one of the west sites is Dr. Olney's site here at Providence. So I'm really excited to, be, to get to work with Nick and with the patients here in the Portland and in Washington area. 
So lots of sites located around the country, but still, there are ALS patients everywhere in this country. Our goal and our mandate for, for this consortium was to try to enroll nearly every ALS patient in the country into this study. So that all ALS really stood for access of all ALS patients. So our participants are gonna be symptomatic patients that might be seen in our, in our initial 34 sites. We think we're gonna to grow to more sites, but obviously in clinic visits. Could also be symptomatic patients that are followed remotely at home. This is, I, I think, how we're gonna hit you know, upper areas of Idaho that we don't have sites that are seeing these patients. How do we enroll them in this type of study? And so we'll have a lot of remote settings, a lot of remote um, digital biomarkers that, and information that we'll be collecting. Pre-symptomatic patients, what is that? So these are individuals that, again, Dr. Olney mentioned about doing genetic testing. So individuals that have a genetic form of the disease and then other family members, maybe those that have the, the genetic um, um, alteration but yet don't have any symptoms. And we're following those as a, um, as a group that are asymptomatic but yet harbor mutations. And then healthy controls. So we have something collecting clinical information, biosamples, longitudinal uh, blood, possibly CSF. We'll see how challenging that is. Um, biosamples at home. They want it, NIH wants us to send home phlebotomy uh, units around the country. Incredibly expensive. We looked into it. And then at home data that people can actually do it at home. We're creating a centralized system to house this. Most of the, uh, all the samples will be housed at NIH repositories. Um, but then we'll hold the clinical information, all the clinical, longitudinal clin clinical information linked to all these samples. We're already doing biomarker analyses for particular biomarkers. We're already including or will be including our, um, samples collected here into a worldwide effort where we're looking and studying tens of thousands of individuals with not only ALS but with other neurodegenerative diseases and looking for some of the basic questions of what's different. All of this, all the data, all the samples, every, all the clinical information will be made freely available to researchers around the world through this portal that we're developing. It's not developed yet. We're a month into it, so hang on. Final slide, just acknowledgement, some of the people in the, in the lab, that data that I showed, um, obviously others at Bear that I collaborate with, um, TJ and the group that I was doing some of the mass spec with, and then the physicists and mathematicians at the Beckman Research Institute in California that created that mathematical model, all the ALS um, consortium members, um, obviously thanks to patients and families that contribute and enroll and participate in our research and obviously funding agencies. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bowser, um, and you're very humble. That's a very exciting grant that you just received, and I think we're all really thrilled to hear more about how it progresses. Um, so I would like to just remind folks, uh, we've got some volunteers and staff coming around to collect any questions that you have. Um, and I'm very excited to introduce our final speaker of the day, Dr. Bob Dagger. Um, neurone therapy has been widely discussed amongst the ALS community. Um, so we're, today we're really honored to be joined by Dr. Bob Dagger, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Development Officer at Brainstorm Cell Therapeutics, who is a leading developer of adult stem cell therapeutics for neurodegenerative diseases. Dr. Dagger has over 20 years of experience sorry about this, um, in the pharmaceutical industry and is a past board certified physician from the American Board of Neurology and Physiatry. He has an extensive therapeutic background concentrated in neuroscience with a focus on neurodegenerative, neuroinflammatory, and movement disorders. Dr. Dagger obtained his medical degree through a joint program between St. Joseph and Bordeaux Universities and has completed residency training at Boston University School of Medicine. He brings expertise through his work as a physician scientist and drug developer in the pharmaceutical industry, along with a strong passion for developing innovative therapeutics for neurological and rare diseases. 
Welcome, Dr. Dagger. Thank you. Hi, everyone. You're going to hear my uh, accent. You're going to remember Bordeaux. But I'm here in the Oregon wine country. <laughs> uh, let's take a vote. Would you like to take five minutes break, or should we continue? Continue? OK. Well, it's a, both a pleasure and an honor to be here. When I was asked earlier in the week on Monday, I think, could you like to um, go to Portland, I said, sure. I took the flight early this morning from Boston, and it's my first time here, and I'm, I'm already loving it, except for the rain, but I'll get used to it. <laughs> uh, then the next question came, well, what would you call your talk? I figured, okay. I'm going to talk to you about neuron and brainstorm, current state, most importantly, what's next, the future. So obviously, uh, the company, the drug, we're going through a transition. Um, uh, we had a significant, uh, strong uh, push towards a uh, FDA advisory committee. Negative, negative opinion came, and now um, we are a group. Got the lessons. Most important is to figure out what would be the best next steps. So as was mentioned, my career, I, I started at Boston University in academia. I did practice for a few years, and then I joined the industry, the dark side back in the time. My colleagues would ask me why. It's the passion about doing this, about coming, seeing you all, see what, what can be done to really make a difference in people's lives with diseases such, such as ALS. So I spent my career 20 plus years in rare diseases, neurologic, MS, Parkinson's, tremor, spinocerebellar ataxia, et cetera, et cetera. And what we learn, unfortunately, what I learned, is we, we hear the word failure a lot more often, unfortunately, than success. So you kind of grow trying to build a thick skin and be resilient and figure out, OK, we're dealing with a brain. Um, as was mentioned earlier, Oncology is at least 10 years ahead of us in, in CNS. So what do we do to be able to be successful in, in CNS drug development? Um, and I'm tasked with this mission now to take the next best steps to figure out um, um, where neuron makes a difference and, and, and how quickly and how best to, to bring it to patients. So the passion is all about that. Um, so quickly here, I'm going to show a little bit of piece of history, not, not a lot, just to, for, for those of you who are not familiar with the company. Um, basically, we are a cell therapy company. We are, we are experienced in that. And uh, we have two platforms. Um, most advanced program is the ALS program, all the way to phase three study that uh, uh, reported and a BLA filed. Um, and a phase two study in progressive multiple sclerosis as well was completed. Um, early studies, uh, preclinical work, uh, in Parkinson's disease and other areas. And we have um, an exosome program. Exosome are these extracellular vesicles that are present in the same uh, milieu, for example, with neuron uh, cells when, when we inject them. These extracellular vesicles have a lot of potential and therapeutic candidates. We have already successfully completed animal model work in um, uh, ARDS in pulmonary disease. Quick piece of the history of this company. It's a very small company, unusual, very unusual in, in, um, in biotech in general, certainly. But look, the company has started over 15 years ago, still going, pushing hard with many, many studies. Um, four studies completed, um, as well as an um, expanded access program not shown here. And what I'm going to be showing you a glimpse of what the readout that is encouraging us to go forward, uh, what it looks like when you look at the data and why it happened to be that way, and then most importantly, 
on the far right, the next study um, that we are, we are planning right now and, uh, and discussing with FDI. So the mechanism, as was, I'm not gonna spend too much time on that, but just suffice it to say that it's complex, and the complexity not only by the areas involved, but also the interplay between them, and what comes first, what comes next, what, what levels, uh, et cetera, and what triggers the next cascade of events. So obviously there is a need to address multiple factors together. It's a very complex disease. Uh, so we have the neuroprotective and neuroinflammation was mentioned a little bit earlier. We, we are learning more and more and a lot about the immune system in the brain um, as well as the um, uh, neurodegenerative process itself. So obviously the immune system has a lot to do with protecting our brain and also perhaps contributing uh, once things uh, start taking place to, to further damage. So how can we tame that system uh, is very important. Um, we need to address factors in a synergistic way. Um, so neuron, which I'll show you briefly, was by design uh, made such that we have mesenchymal cells that have their innate effects on the immune system on modulating uh, inflammation and add on top of that basically neurotropic factors that are very important to protect the neurons from further damage. Um, quick schematic here was shown briefly earlier when you look at the butterfly of the spinal cord, the gray matter in the, in the spinal cord, and you have that circulating fluid, CSF, around it, and we inject our needle in the lumbar area. Um, we go in, inside that CSF fluid that is a, a living, a moving, a, a, with a high turnover that goes from the lumbar area all the way up to the brain and back down and up and down. And with that, basically bringing all the nutrients as well as eliminating um, um, toxins, etc. We talked about neurofilaments, for example, one of those filaments inside the neurons, such as neurofilament light that we captured and they, they they inform us quite a bit about, about the, the process, the disease process. So with neuron, we basically take the, the patient's own bone marrow. We get the bone marrow aspiration, so we call that autologous, uh, as opposed to allogeneic, getting, getting it from somebody else or from outside source. So that has great benefit in that we basically avoid um, unwanted uh, immune responses. And when we take those bone marrow cells, we isolate the mesenchymal cells, um, connective tissue cells that we basically harvest and we, um, we induce them uh, to, to make a lot, a, a very large amount of different neurotropic factors, a host of those factors. Uh, BDNF, GDNF, HIF, etc., VEGF. Um, and as I showed earlier, that has been successfully done now for many years, starting with the animals, and now we have a number of human trials uh, safely and um, showing response that um, we are still trying to figure out that many years later um, what it takes to have those cells help a patient from further deteriorating and have the, help the function to, um, to be well. So I will talk a little bit about that. On the mesenchymal stem cell side, um, we basically uh, have, we, we have shown early on that we slowed the further degeneration in the, in the mice model of disease. Um, we have improved function, um, and we prolong survival. Um, I think Bob mentioned earlier, we, we also cured many mice and many diseases, but when it comes to human, uh, the story is very different. Uh, what, can, what can we do? We, can, we have to do with what we have. So based on that, 
a lot of energy, a lot of excitement to move forward. So we added these nootropic factors. This I'm talking 12 years ago when the newly rejuvenated excitement about those come to be, uh, with again the promise, the hope that we can arrest that disease and and, and put a halt to to to, um, to further progression. And we got what we got, and I'll explain a little bit um, what what we what what are the learnings from what we saw. So after the phase two, uh, which was a well-designed, well-run well study, we learned that there is a need, and was mentioned earlier as well in terms of ability to measure, there is a need to make sure that we enroll patients who show manifestation of progression of their disease in that short period of six months, 28 weeks in this case. So how do we do that? Um, that's something that you design on paper and when it comes to application on the ground, you see that actually there was a side effect of, of this trial design that you see right here. So in order to confirm this progression of disease, and in order to do that before we take bone marrow from patients, we had to, I, I can't look back, but we had to basically allow three months here of monitoring, watching patients. This has died on me. And after that, you take the bone marrow and you have another two months, about six weeks minimum, really, to harvest these cells and make them. So we, have, we end up with five month period before baseline. You add a criterion to that, that at the screening visit, we chose a score for the ALS FRS of 25, really a low score considering recent trials. So you start above 20, 25 and you have five months to go. No wonder we ended up with a population that we called ad, with advanced disease or more advanced that uh, was hoped for with a large percentage of that population falling below 25 by time baseline comes. And if you all know anything, and most important in clinical development trials is baseline, because everything is measured against that. So you have to make sure that you get the right target patient for that therapy, for that platform at baseline. And now we're starting to learn, okay, what is the optimal time and type of disease that neuron can make the most impact on. Um, so the, the study design was designed as such by necessity, and then we had to um, implement multiple dosing um, intrathecally, meaning via lumbar puncture, three times every two months, or every eight weeks exactly. At week zero, 16, week eight, and week 16, and then we followed them for another 12 weeks after week 16. So we, we needed to see some benefit, but not for a long period of time. So six, six months or 28 weeks uh, um, in a CNS drug development space is relatively considered short. Anyways, with this in mind, we executed the trial under significant and unusual conditions, one of them being COVID-19 and the difficulty of measuring pulmonary function from other things and not being able to visit the hospital, uh, having remote visits, et cetera. Um, but we wanted to make sure that at baseline we had slow vital capacity more than 65%, so people had the ability to have good, good pulmonary function to be able to sustain in a six-month trial, et cetera, et cetera. And we needed to show that one, at least one point per month decline in those initial three months. So a total of three points over three months, um, which was seen, but again, the downside that um, further progression occurred um, as well. So what were the results from from the overall trial. What I'm gonna show next is the, the current thinking that the company and, and the FDA advisors and our advisors have been pointing to us is that 
this subset of population that has mild to moderate disease early in the disease course, not too advanced, not too early, where we need to still see disease progression. But one of the way we looked at it, we happen to have a pre-specified subgroup in the analysis plan, uh, meaning pre-specified meaning you, you select that before you, um, you lock the database and you look at the data, so prospectively done. Um, of over 35, the idea was, the hope at least, was that the baseline uh, would fall somewhere around 35. Uh, well, that was not the case. Surprise happened when database was locked that the baseline average was at 31, so four points below. Um, anyways, when we, when we look at this small subgroup from the overall population, less than 200 patients, 95 and 94 per each arm, we ended up with 58 patients and divided 26 and 32, 26 on neuron and 32 on placebo. And what I'm showing on this slide is side by side, the primary endpoint, was, which also by itself is a novel and challenging endpoint to meet. It's a high bar, it's a difficult, which basically you need to show you need to break the, the, the slope, the, the trajectory, the curve of decline over time, and, 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 and that requires uh, a, a very big treatment effect to achieve that. So on the left side is that primary endpoint. You see in this population that is um, less advanced or with ALS-FRS baseline score of 35 and above, um, there is a 19% treatment difference but notice the p-value is not significant. Um, again, this is a uh, uh, secondary analysis. It's an analysis that came after the overall population. Now we're looking at subgroup, and um, you see that 35% of patients out of those 26 were responders versus 16% on placebo. So when you look at something like that, you have to pause and think, is this real? Is this, are we seeing something true? Or is this just random, you toss a coin? And, um, and I'll show you some data on that uh, a little bit uh, in, in a couple slides. On the right side, you look at this classic or this important uh, endpoint, which was a key secondary endpoint uh, advocated by FDA to be primary as well um, in, in many trials in the past, which is this change from baseline of the total score. So if you started at 35, are you going to drop to 33, or are you going to drop to 30, or et cetera? You see a change of 1.6 points on neuron versus 3.7. So basically a difference of over two points in that six-month period. I'm going to show you a little bit more on that, which is important. So what I just showed you is shown here at, the far, at, at week 28. So that that level there. But importantly, when you look back at that same endpoint, you see that this two points difference roughly is maintained from early on when we could measure it at week two, week four, eight, all the way to week 28. And I'll remind you that people were dosed three times at zero, eight, and 16. So you see the consistency of effect. And now again, we look at this, okay, is this, you know, spurious finding, is it true? Um, I guess you know the answer by now that we have not given up because when we see something like that, but then more. When you look at uh, basically the change, um, starting from week 12 here, you see at week eight there was no separation that was meaningful and a change from baseline and the score. But you look at week, week 12 on, you see a statistical significance with p-value less than 0.05 at multiple times in that, uh, over the course of the study, um, including the, the key secondary endpoint at week 28 over there that I showed you earlier. Now when we look differently, we ask the question here, okay, this, this is, the population over 35 or had baseline that really very early in the disease. 
does it only work for those? Or is there a sign that there is a treatment benefit in other subgroups as well? And here you see the cuts with baseline thresholds at the different points, all the way to 26, staying above 25. So you see at 34, 33, no matter where you look at it, you still see that maintained difference. Again, in that, in the, in that size of effect that, um, uh, that we are intrigued by. Now when we see that and, and putting it together, together with all the other endpoints, we do something here to simplify the slide for you, it's complex statistics. It's basically what are the odds for us to see all of this consistency at different time points and over time that this happens just by chance. That, you know, we, the, the z-score, the, the measure we, we use for that, is 0.02. 2 percent that this could happen by chance. Hmm. then we, we have to pause and say there is something there that we must pursue. And the company is putting all efforts now to figure out what's the best way that we can demonstrate the benefit uh, properly and control for the variables and the things that we saw that I showed you in the design, design earlier to make sure that we do the right thing and um, we basically uh, we come out successful. Um, one slide I want to show you on neurofilament light, and I agree with Bob, everybody, it's on vogue now, everybody is talking about biomarkers. Here we see a p-value significant, less than 0.05 as well. The magnitude is not as big as in other studies, but we do see that it's separated from placebo by dropping neurofilament light by 11% reduction, where the placebo stayed about the same all the way. And you see that maintained over the duration of the trial. So what is the summary? Obviously, we had a negative trial. So this phase three trial was, was difficult. It's, it, when the readout came out now a long time ago, in the overall population, um, we did not meet those stringent, the primary endpoint that was uh, mentioned, etc., and then you stop and you go and look and, okay, should you give up? Is this the end? Or is there something there that we have to, um, to study more closely, more deeply? And we think that we should study it more closely and more deeply, um, but with better care and, and, and focusing on, 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 the right, um, on the right elements in the design and the population. So this and I showed you one subgroup analysis with it, with it multiple others as well. So basically what, what we came home with from, this, from the number of lessons learned from this phase three trial, uh, that in less advanced disease, there is a consistent effect across multiple endpoints and over time. What do we do or how can we demonstrate that, that with um, going to the burden of proof, which is um, basically um, um, significance when you demonstrate it at the primary endpoint prospectively in a defined disease population. We feel that the biomarker data is supportive. It did not go in the opposite direction. It did not go against what we would expect. Um, we will study that again um, as Bob mentioned, now it's, it's becoming part of all trials moving forward, and we will learn more as we go. Um, the safety, we have now done multiple repeat administrations, uh, multiple trials, etc. In the expanded access program, we have also duration longer as well, and uh, basically we know what this therapy, which is in auto autologous cells, administered back to the same um, person with ALS, we know what to expect. Um, so we feel that there is a positive benefit risk that we ought to explore further. So current status is what I just described. It's a 
transition or transitory period. It's a, um, it's a going back to, um, to the drawing boards and reflecting, getting advice from patient communities. We have held a number of meetings from scientific leaders in the field and from regulators. So the FDA um, has asked us to um, go for a face-to-face -face meeting to discuss the plan moving forward. Well, and we absolutely uh, are signing up for that. We are in the process of basically finalizing the planning for that. Um, we will be very eager to take all input, all feedback, and incorporate it in the next trial, um, which is currently in the planning phase. I'll give you a sneak peek today. I figure this will be my last slide. So as the draft shows you, we are going to be basically focusing on narrowing that pretreatment period, so less variability, and, and attend at the heterogeneity of disease in a way that we try to keep the population ho homogeneous as possible. We want to minimize noise in the data so that what we look at and what we read uh, will, be, will, will give us uh, definitive answers. Our quest is now to design the trial that will give us definitive answers. Um, so we're looking for a double-blind placebo-controlled uh, phase. We will be offering standard of care to everyone. Um, as mentioned um, earlier, basically, uh, you have to be stable on that and not change it during the course of the trial. And then we will study neuron on top of that um, against placebo. And we will do the treatment course that was done before, um, three doses, eight weeks apart. And then we are in the process of planning and thinking about an extension study as well. Following that, we will be getting input from the regulator about it as well. Um, with that, I'm going to stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Thanks so much. Thank you. If I can ask our other presenters to come up and join our, our panel here on the platform, thank you so much. Um, my name is Lance Christian. I'm the executive director of ALS Northwest. Proud and happy to see so many people here. I want to thank all the people living with ALS who have joined us here today in person as well as online. Um, all of you are the people who drive this mission and our recognition that you want to be part of the solution and want to make a difference by participating in clinical trials and supporting the science of ALS is crucial for making a difference. I'm always humbled when I hear a panel like this and realize the brilliant people who have leaned into this community to make a difference in understanding this disease. Um, our organization has existed for over 21 years. We were formerly the ALS Association Oregon and Southwest Washington chapter. We are now an independent ALS organization affiliated with ALS United, a consortium of other independent ALS organizations. And our commitment to ALS research is nonstop. Um, we've contributed millions of dollars to the science of ALS over many years and, and will continue to do so in the future, as well as continuing to support and want to do more to support our local clinical partners at the ALS centers who provide that crucial link, that bridge between the science of ALS and the testing of these therapies. So I'm humbled by the brilliance of the people. First of all, I want to say all of you have worked way harder in life than I have for education and for, for moving forward in life. It's impressive. And, um, but, you know, just to open it up a little bit to start with, I've got a lot of questions here, We're gonna, and, and they're all from the people here in the room and some people online. But um, I like to just ask you guys to reflect on each other's talks. Like, what did you hear today that found, you found interesting or was most exciting to you? So let me open it up. And since I know Nick very well, Nick, let me ask you first. Yeah, uh, no, I, I, it's awesome to be a part of this uh, table here. Uh, all the talks are great. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it was, it was exciting stuff. I, I, I've been following the neuron story for a long time. Uh, Dr. Bowser, I've seen him talk many times. Great to see uh, Dr. Wills talk as well. So yeah, just, just, just honored to be a part of this research consortium here. Research talk. Yeah. Um, Anson Wilkes, um, yeah, every talk was, was really enjoyable and um, I think targeted different things. It was great to hear, you know, in depth kind of discussion of neuron and biomarkers and kind of ongoing research. And, um, you know, I know Nick kind of, he's, you know, I see run into him a few times locally. We kind of operate in the same area. So, um, yeah, and really thankful for the opportunity to speak. Thanks. Yeah, no, I echo our comments already heard. It was nice to see that, you know, with none of us talking to one another beforehand, you actually got a good segmentation, a lot of iterations and repetitions throughout. So that was really good to see. Uh, the Neuron Study I'm kind of familiar with for other reasons and working with them at different stages, but really nice to, you know, meet the clinicians that are taking care of the patients here locally and, and hopefully interacting with some of the patients here. So uh, just really excited to be here. For me, it's really uh, the pleasure to be around patients. And I always go back to, I have stopped seeing patients a few years ago. And um, the passion, the energy that we need and on the pharmaceutical side, I'm, I'm the pharma representative here, so I have to talk about that. It's, it's really driven by uh, being close to the patient and uh, here literally me sitting in this room um, brings me back to, to the meaningfulness of what we do, all of us, and, and the perseverance and to never give up and to lift yourself back up, dust things off and um, learn. It's, it's, a, it's a journey of learning and then do the right thing the next time. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Dr. Wilkes. Um, thank you for the good overview of ALS disease mechanisms. It was a, quite a list of things that you listed, RNA process, processing, protein misfolding, mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, are those individual causes for what may be part of ALS, or can all those things be happening all at once at one time for people? So I don't think it's fully elucidated. I mean, that's part of, you know, the important research that's ongoing, you know, aside from therapies, is, is understanding the disease more. And it's likely that all these mechanisms are occurring simultaneously um, to, to bring about the disease. And it really stands to reason that there's a multimodal approach, to use a term used previously, for treatment um, targeting these various things, because they're probably all playing a role to some extent. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, and, and if anyone else wants to jump in, please yeah. do. I, I, I would add, I mean, I think we think of also ALS as just probably a very heterogeneous group, probably different things. Like it could just be that one mechanism that tips something off and then, then all the different ones get involved. So I think, um, I think that's the challenge in, in doing clinical trials and all these. And that's why this very specific, you know, as highlighted before, biomarkers, if you have a very specific subtype like the SOD1, that's probably going to be an easier target to hit. Eventually, still 20 years in the making plus, but. Yeah, no, I agree. It's what triggers ALS in one person may be different than the other, another person, but then the multitude of pathways sort of coalesce over time across the patients. Great, thanks. Um, for the panel, uh, for currently available therapies for ALS, what if, what if any studies have been done related to the impact of quality of life? Does increased life expectancy correlate with an increase in quality of life? That's a good question. Um, I don't think enough has been done looking at quality of life measures for even our current treatments. Um, I don't know, does anyone know I think, I think what, the, what quality of life studies have been done, even with really is all, um, which has been around the longest? Yeah, a follow-up question for, sort of from another person is, do the medications currently available extend life at the end or slow progression throughout the course of the disease? An editorial comment, many people are not very excited to extend their lives by several months when they feel like they 
or are invalids, they prefer extension on the front end. What do you think happens there? I, I mean, I would also add on to the last question that I do think, I think there's quality of life surveys starting to be added on to the clinical trials. There certainly should probably be more of that. And then I guess uh, to take the second question, um, I do think a lot of the drugs are cumulative and the earlier you start, the, the more it does. Um, and I guess that's one of the reasons I was trying to show that in, in some of the graphs is I do think that the earlier starters you can, you can see better, but uh, and unfortunately, again, the one compound are having more modest effects. So I think, you know, the drugs probably work similarly and, and you know, rilazole, the focus is, is, you know, mortality benefit, but that's just really because the trial was designed that way. But they probably all work to slow down the rate at which you progress. And, you know, quality of life is going to inherently be improved if patients are spending more time at a less advanced stage. So to answer the second question, um, it's not kind of tacked on to the end when you know, patients are at a really advanced stage. It likely slows down the entire trajectory or the, the curve, to use a word previously used, the um, rate of progression kind of tilts up and that slope is, is decreased. So. And I, I would think that, you know, changing that, that slope of trajectory is probably it, depend, independent of what that drug, FDA approved drug is. If you started it earlier in that disease process, you're going to impact it more. Um, it kind of uh, it still goes back to even how, earlier, how early can we diagnose someone quickly with this disease and get them on treatment as quick as possible. Um, I think doing that will change that, that slope to the biggest impact versus starting a patient on a drug very late in the disease process in which, as we just mentioned, there's so many mechanisms that are now in play um, that it could be challenging for any one drug to impact disease very late in the disease versus earlier stages of the disease. Thank you. <clears throat> this has a question, has a question, and there's several things here that talk about the length of clinical trials, and, and many of you referenced that. Dr. Dagger, you talked about the reformulation of the neuron trial, the, the design work being done. Dr. Bowser, you talked about um, length of trials and, and needing people who are fairly early in the diagnosis to be part of clinical trials. Um, who determines the length of a trial? And is it researchers that make that decision, or is it funders? And what things can be done that can inc increase the opportunity for people with more slowly progressive ALS to be part of clinical trials? Big question. Maybe I should take that one first. And Go ahead, give, Mr. Industry. Give you the industry <laughs> look at this one. Uh, we start with the clinical um, meaningfulness of a change. How much time does it take? Uh, starting with your primary endpoint first, and also the secondary endpoints as well. And then you look at the balance between uh, the duration on placebo versus active. So you don't want to drag it too long. And also, you don't want it to be too short where you cannot measure. And then you put forward a proposal, and then the regulatory body will have to agree that it makes sense with those criteria to define it that way. And also, we have the history, the learning of the past, uh, how things, um, you know, I worked in multiple sclerosis for years. We started our first phase two study for three years duration, and then two years, and now we have biomarker, which is MRI imaging of brain lesions. We do six months, and more recently now we have four months. So it all depends on the precision and, and min minimizing impact on, yeah. What about the, are there, gonna, are there more opportunities for people with more slowly progressive ALS to participate in trials? Is that an opportunity or is it, is it, a, is it just a barrier that's hard to overcome? I, I guess I would speak to that, that I think the expanded access programs help have any you know, more patients participate in research and clinical trials. Um, I think I would also add to the first question that, I mean, it, sometimes I'm asked about, you know, um, you know input on a trial or, or whatnot, but it generally a lot of times it, when it, once it comes to me, I'm just generally following a general protocol that's already been kind of designed. 
Um, I'd also like to add actually to the last, the last question though too of quality of life um, and the FDA approved treatments that I do think it's actually important for earlier diagnosis. It's a very heavy diagnosis to make, but the earlier you can kind of make the diagnosis for someone to process it, they can think about the FDA approved treatments earlier and also get connected into an ALS team clinic which also has some data that shows a better quality of life. I mean, I'm lucky enough to interact with a lot of companies and help impact some of the decision making, but clearly it's a multitude of input and what, come, or what is determined to be that final trial design and the regulators come into play. So I know our European colleagues, they, they go out 12 months. And one reason is they think you need to go out 12 months to see a significant impact on, on ALS. And then the second is their regulatory agency wants 12 months. And so it's a combination of lots of different factors that play into what is the final study design. And also agree with slowly progressing patients, it's really hard to get into some of these trials. Uh, but, you know, expanded access and other upcoming programs, I think, will uh, facilitate patients that currently seem to be on the outs to be able to get in and, and participate. Okay, great. Um, many of you mentioned uh, sort of using multiple therapies. So given the multiple hit model for ALS pathogenesis, what efforts are being made to investigate combination therapies? Well, I think there's a tremendous interest in the combination therapy approach. The problem is, what, what drugs do you pick? I mean, I think we now even have the point of needing, needing to study what's the combination of our currently approved drugs if you take all of them at once, which there are patients doing that. And so we don't know that answer. And so we need to figure that out because as we have upcoming trials, how do we effectively create the study design if patients are on one, two, and or three currently approved drugs, and then you're gonna throw another drug on top of that. And then at the end, for especially for the sponsor, their concern is what's the drug-drug interactions how is that potentially um, generating adverse events in, in people that might be taking different combinations? So it's a, it's a challenging question because usually you, you want to build effective multimodal therapies on things that already work and then let's add another to that. And so only in the last year and a half have we now gotten three drugs, four actually, with two different formulations, but multiple drugs that are approved we can start to more aggressively think about how to do combinations. That's a great scientist's yes. explanation, but as a clinician, how do you sit down and talk with people about what they should do or what their options are? I, I would just add that um, the one thing to focus on with the currently FDA approved drugs is that they're all relatively safe. Um, you know, they're, the monitoring for Rylazole with LFTs, there's not a lot of monitoring for Rilibrio or Radicava. Um, and they do have their side effects, but n n by and large, not severe. So, you know, with their effect size, I think that's a really attractive attribute. If, if there were serious side effects that would be, um, you know, a reasonable risk. I think that my approach would be different, but I think I, I typically offer all three drugs. Um, unfortunately, a um, kind of built-in barrier is, is cost and insurance coverage for multiple drugs that are now available um, and the fact that they're expensive. But yeah, that's what I'd say. And I would add, I think some of the, um, I like to present all the data openly as best as I can for what patients know they're getting into. I'd like to have them to have all have access to the drugs they want to be in, but I think it becomes that cost barrier that you don't want patients paying $10,000 a month for every drug. And I think some of the places we're going to get answers, hopefully for the cumulative effects, is probably going to be a lot of these registries. So we're a part of actually multiple registries now. Um, the ALS Natural History Consortium, CREATE, you could think of the Healy trial as looking at the research population and about to be a part of the all ALS. So I think that will be places we can look for those answers hopefully someday. Okay, thank you. Um, Follow-up question about the Healy platform trial. Um, obviously everyone in this room and online wants the fastest movement possible to find therapies to get access within the clinic. 
Um, with the Healy platform trial, it seems like a very interesting model to be able to sort of expedite some of these trials. But a question's come up is, um, when, you, when there may be multiple modalities for therapy delivery, um, oral, intrathecal, IV, et cetera, how, does, how is placebo maintained in the Healy trial and, and not influence like the, outcome, the study outcome? Good question. I mean, yeah, actually I didn't go over that, but actually almost a lot of the mechanisms have been very different. There's been injections, there's been uh, liquids, there's been solids, and all I can, I'm not a statistician, but there's some very complicated statisticians, and it's how it's randomized that you're randomized within the actual regimen is how they're able to keep that going. So, I mean, they have, even though, um, say the injection, you know, it was hard for some patients to say, I might be injecting a placebo for six months. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Bowser, you talked a lot about the challenge of getting uh, the treatment modalities into the central nervous system. Has, the, um, has there been, uh, has the efficiency of getting therapies where they need to go been improving, or is it still the same struggle that's been going on for many years? Well, there's still a constant struggle, and obviously it depends on the the drug, the compound that you're trying to get into the central nervous system. But um, there have been vast improvements over the last decade in ways to cross over into the central nervous system. And so I mentioned nanoparticles. Um, you can use gene therapy approaches as well, um, as opposed to you know what has already been mentioned for a few trials, which are direct delivery, um, intrathecal, or even within the brain itself um, in some instances. So. We've made great improvements, and I think there continues to be novel approaches in even moving from an intrathecal design into uh, new, new neurosurgical techniques that allow you to not go directly um, into the cord itself, but actually go on sort of like right on top of it and layer on the compound that you want or a treatment that you want and allow it to get in that way. So I think there's Newer, there's newer and more improved or, uh, uh, methods that will enable uh, treatments of the next generation of drugs. Great. <clears throat> um, I have a couple of questions here about some specific trials or specific therapies. Um, for Dr. Dagger, for Neuron, with ALS, FRS at 35 or above, would that indicate earlier inter in initiation of treatment will give a better data or be more effective? Would you see continued effect of therapy following uh, receiving treatment for a longer time, say more than 28 weeks? I'm not sure I got the question fully. Um, do you mind? Well, uh, you talked about sort of the, the one of the challenges of the of the trial that, that didn't reach its data points was the 25 being the ALS FRS. 25. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I believe you were talking about uh, the reanalysis at 35 being more effective. Is that is that just changing sort of the bar of what's measured, or are we missing a better effect with people at that level? No, actually, what what we presented in the um, briefing document and the advisory committee is the challenge with what we call the floor effect. When you go too low on the scale, many of those items, of the 12 items, many of them will reach a score of zero. Um, and it so happened to be more common if the total score is 25 and lower. Um, it's much less when the total score is 35 and higher. You don't have those zeros on the individual items. So you are able to have a better opportunity to measure change over the 28 period. The other piece about that, and that's common with other neurodegenerative diseases, and I worked with many others, uh, you know, with uh, Alzheimer's, we see that. We have now MCI, for example, with Parkinson's. Um, the earlier you can um, um, attack the mechanisms, the pathophysiological mechanism, the better chance you have at salvaging and, and preventing further progression down the line. So it's, it seems logical to start early. Now, the cutoff of 35 is arbitrary, and um, we, 
I did not show it in the trial design. We are not going for a particular score cutoff like that because we don't want to be arbitrary in the cutoff. But it's basically the idea of coming, um, coming, coming to treatment as soon as diagnosis is made, as quickly as possible, get on standard of care, and if you qualify for neuron, we, uh, as was mentioned earlier, there is no drug-drug interaction or contraindication to, um, that we worry about to administer it alongside available therapies. So it will be, be an added synergistic benefit, hopefully. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, some other specific questions uh, about things that maybe you referenced or didn't. This is one is specifically for Dr. Bowser. How do you view the clinical trials for AK V9 at Northwestern University? Do you know about that trial? I'm sorry. About AK, AK, AK oh, yeah. V9. Well, I know about AV9, yes. AV, yeah, AV9, sorry. Yeah, so that's a vector that um, it targets neurons to some degree. Um, so it's not a really well-targeted virus, but it does infect neurons. And so you can deliver things in the neurons with that, uh, with that vector. But it's, a, it's still fairly um, unspecified on exactly one cell versus another cell. I think going forward with these gene therapy trials, what we need are vectors that really target a specific cell of interest. And so um, the, the next generation vectors then will really be focused to those that maybe only interact with motor neurons or maybe only act with specific glial subpopulations and no other cell, because then you're not trying to deliver some gene therapy to cells that you don't want it to go to. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, this is sort of a follow-up connected to um, antisense agglial nucleotide therapy. Um, is this particular modality being pursued for other genetic forms of ALS? And what is the status of any of that research? I know some of it. I don't, I don't, were you involved I start, in it? I could, I, I could start briefly, and you could probably fill in. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, the most two other big targets are C9, ORF72, what Dr. Wilkes mentioned in his talk, and FUS. And there is some progress, Dr. Bowser, you probably know even more about it, but in New York of people taking the, the ASOs for FUS and then the C9, there was one trial that was unfortunately negative with the neurofilament elevating, which is probably a bad thing. So that one was shut down and there's further trials um, in progress as the last brief update. No, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the C9 ASOs, antisense to date, there have been two. Um, both have not shown a benefit and both showed increases in neurofilament. Um, FUS seems to potentially be beneficial. More is coming out on that. And there's another one at, for ataxin that, um, that is still early phases, so we don't have the answers. What do you do with that information, though, when you postulate that you think it should work and then it doesn't? So, so what do you one do with that? fundamental difference is C9 is a repeat disorder, um, which I think changes the approach. Um, you know, most of the SOD1 mutations are, you know, for coding regions and, um, you know, for repeat disorders, there are several neuromuscular disorders that are associated with repeats of these non-coding regions. Um, and the approach is different for genetic therapies for those and potentially a yes. little more difficult. Yeah. But what do you do with data that goes against your hypothesis? Yeah. Well, what you publish you it so you hopefully no one repeats it. Um, and. You know, as a scientist, um, most of what I do fails, and so that's life, and that's what we're used to. Um, and so you, you pivot, you go from what you learned in that study, and you propose the next. Okay. Do any of you ever sort of reinvestigate or repeat work by other people to sort of validate or test? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> that's, part of, that's part of the scientific method as well. So I'm usually most happy about you know stuff you know findings that we published when someone else has repeated it because then I know look somebody else somewhere else in the world has repeated it and you know part of the emphasis with neurofilaments has really been the numbers of studies from numbers of groups around the world that all pretty much come to the same conclusion and so yeah that's really part of the whole scientific method is that reproducibility. 
Um, a couple questions about sort of demographics and some environmental factors. Dr. Wilkes, you mentioned um, roughly that roughly ratios of 1.3 for women and 1.5 for men mm -hmm. for prevalence. Is there any indicator why we think there's a difference there? I'm not certain. Um, we do know that kind of bulbar onset is, is a much more common phenotype that we see in, in women, but um, I don't, you know, I don't know that there's an answer to that. Um, and it's not a tremendous kind of risk difference between, um, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I do think there is, touching on what I kind of discussed briefly in, in my talk, um, a lot of interest in why diseases manifest at certain ages, even for, you know, just sort of the familial ALS forms that we presumably know more about from a mechanism standpoint. What makes a patient have symptoms 20 years before a very close relative with the disorder? What is influencing that? Is it an environmental factor? Is it some sort of protective factor um, that's genetic? Um, so uh, I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I think that it's not known uh, necessarily, and but very interesting to think about those sort of things. Yeah, and I think that <clears throat> Some of the ongoing registries, the CDC registry, natural history studies, and now with all ALS, hopefully we'll be able to make some insight, in, insights into those types of questions because we don't know enough. And another big thing that you know, NIH was really pushing for all ALS to push into as hard as we can, and we have uh, other programs that we'll have to bring on board, and that is ethnic diversity within our study populations. And so. Most of our research studies, most of our clinical trials, you know, over 90% participants are uh, Caucasian, Northern European descent. Um, so we don't know much about other ethnic groups. C9, ORF72, the most uh, common genetic cause of ALS, absolutely true. If you go to Asia, it doesn't exist. And so it's not the most common genetic form of ALS in Asia. It is in those of Caucasian, Northern European descent. So we need and we must learn more about different ethnic groups because I think we'll learn not only more about the genetics but also more about some of the both commonalities and differences across the spectrum of the disease and hopefully some of the triggers that you mentioned. Thank you so much for bringing up that issue around diversity because um, obviously we have a lot of data from what modern Western uh, uh, first world countries, but. Is there a belief that there's as much ALS in third world countries or other parts of the world with, a, with less developed medical systems that's just maybe not diagnosed? What do we know about that? I think we need to learn more. There are focused efforts in certain areas of the world trying to explore that question. Um, but to me, it's still an open-ended question. We don't know enough. We, it's, it's probably there in, in studies that have looked in different geographic locations around the world, the incidents seem to be around the same. And so it's there, but we just haven't studied it well. We need a global all ALS. Say that again. Yes. We need like a global all ALS. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one, uh, you know, Dr. Dagger and Dr. Bowser might step out of this one, although you'll have opinions, but uh, Anson and Nick, who live in the Northwest, um, do you have people who come to you and can you talk about po the possibility of blue-green algae being an, a factor in ALS? Because that is something we have a lot here in the Pacific Northwest. So uh, what's your experience with that? But anyone feel free to comment, but it's probably something that comes across your plate more frequently. So yeah, I mentioned it very briefly in passing in my talk, but that's a, an active area of interest with one researcher at, o, researcher at OHSU is, is the whole concept of, of exposome, um, the you know environmental factors um, and their role in ALS, and I think that we're very early days in understanding that more. Um, I think that there's a lot to it, and um, you know it, the, I don't know the answer is, is is the way to answer that question, but it very well could be related. I know that we have a lot of ALS. I mean, I. You know, he, the, Dr. Spencer is trying to collaborate on that and, and look into some of those, you know, exposures and, and their role. 
Um, so I think we, we have a lot more to learn in that domain. I would say I got that question probably more a couple years ago, uh, less often. I'm certainly a story I'm following. Um, I think there's the L-serine that people would take sometimes, but I think there was a thing on ALS Untangled that came out about it. But um, yeah, I think it's still kind of a story to unfold. Well, I'm going to ask your local clinicians, and are you, do you guys um, collect that type of information? Like either geographic or environmental exposures, occupations? Not routinely, but like I said, um, the Dr. Spencer, particularly at OHSC, is trying to, you know, encourage, you know, collaborate and, and try to look into that more. Um, um, so that sort of exposure history and um, demographics and that sort of thing. But routinely, not in clinical practice, not always am I kind of gathering that sort of data. I would just say not routinely, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, this is more of a clinical progression question. Um, there was a reference made to body mass index and how it can affect progression of ALS. Uh, do people who are physically active, lean athletes with ALS progress more quickly as opposed to someone with a much higher body mass index? My, my BMI slow progression. I think we know the answer to that. I mean, I think that also, you know, I, I tried to make it very clear that age and family history really are the only known definitive risk factors. And some of these associations, um, you know, are, are not clearly known to be disease causing or pathogenic. There are plenty of uh, patients that are, you know, very fit, who never develop ALS. So I think that they're interesting associations, but, you know, their role in, in risk for ALS, um, much less their role for progression, is, is not really known. We do know that patients who are losing a lot of weight tend to, that tends to correlate with um, faster progression, um, whether that's a direct cause or with what is causing, you know, whether the weight loss is causing the progression or the progression is causing the weight loss is not certain, but that definitely is certain, you know, it definitely correlates. Um, but as far as a lower BMI um, related to faster progression, I don't know that we know that for sure. I don't think I have much to add, but I agree with Dr. Wilkes. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to channel our um, assistive technology person, uh, uh, Ashley, here. And it was exciting to hear about the home measures for, for possibly learning more about ALS progression and, and collecting data. How would speech measure for ALS um, be used as a home measure for, for clinical trial work? How would that work? Uh, yeah, people are very interested in doing that now. Um, so there's a number of publications already out that are looking at measuring speech at home and showing that it's predictive of disease progression as measured by the in-clinic visits. And so how might this work in the future? So far, we haven't done this, but in the future, possibly, again, back to trying to be more inclusive in our studies and our trials, one could imagine collecting more information in a remote setting um, uh, around the clinical trial, around speech, for instance, um, and collecting a, a very rich data set over the course of that trial. Um, I'm not aware of a clinical trial that's included speech yet, um, but I think that's in the near term. I think it'll be in the next year or two we'll start seeing that. Great. What's it gonna take with your project? It sounds like you're gonna have to have champions across all parts of the community. How are you going to build, build that community? All oh, ALS, yeah. <laughs> Again, we're one month in. Um, I have numerous Zoom calls with NIH officials every week on this. Um, it's, and what they're envisioning is a challenge. I mean, we're, we're used to what we can do in the clinics and working with our clinical colleagues. Um, but doing things in a remote setting is very hard. Trying to reach every patient with ALS in this country will be a challenge. And what we need then is to think about other ways to do things that we traditionally do. So, so in-clinic visions will, will be sort of that foundational group of individuals. They're really going to be the best studied and have the most data um, that we can rely on. But 
um, how, do we re how do we reach other areas of the country or all areas of the country? And I think it'll be a multitude of uh, having outreach programs into um, uh, communities and ethnic groups that we traditionally have not reached in well. And so we're building one right now. Um, and it will include using social media, other groups like Everything ALS, I Am ALS, that have been reaching out already to patients in remote settings, piggybacking on that and saying, let's reach your population as well. So it will take, a, you know, it, it will take a community in order to make it happen. Um, and so it'll be, it'll be a large effort from a large number of individuals if we're gonna make a success out of this. Great. Well, as a recipient of an NIH grant, um, uh, this is maybe a hot topic question, but how do um, private pharma or biotech companies work with research funded by government or philanthropy? How's, how do those two worlds intersect? In what, in what format? I mean, um, well, I think the intent of the question, let's say research is funded by NIH, NIH. Yep. then how does that then sort of get translated into the work that needs to be done to do clinical trials? Is that at a point where, where pharma steps in? I mean, how, how, whose interest is being represented in those decisions? Well, I, mean, I, I see that sort of a multiple angled question. So if you're thinking traditional NIH funded working on a hypothesis generating a drug, yeah, those of us that get NIH funding can maybe take that into early phase studies and maybe with the Healy platform study, that's a phase two study. But from there, we're kind of done. It really then takes industry sponsorship right. in order to run a large phase three trial that's gonna cost 50 to $100 million. I can't get a grant of that size. Wait a minute, I just did. So maybe I can't, but, yeah. um, yeah. but, <laughs> but it really, that, that's, when, that's where industry comes in yeah, and a, becomes critical. Probably yeah. a great follow-up question for you, Dr. Decker. Yeah, how, is that, how are those funds found? Yeah, I think it's gonna start also by the legal and patent and you know, the, the industry has to have the end game in mind. And then oftentimes early on, you could also garner uh, small um, funding, um, you know, uh, non-dilutive from, you know, from, bene from various sources, but uh, at the end of the day, it's gonna be a, um, a business investment or the business end game in mind, yes. Mm -hmm. But then I didn't know if the question, because the all ALS consortium, yeah. you know, if you looked on that slide, it had industry listed there. And so how is industry then participating in this NIH-funded program? Um, as I mentioned, there's this AMP ALS portion to it, and the way this is envisioned, and they've done this in, in Alzheimer's disease and in Parkinson's disease, and so there's a model for this to make it work. Um, usually it's large pharma that come to the table, and they want input on the types of data collected, you know, in this natural history study, Etc. And so they actually provide funding for the consortium. Yeah. And so that's what's called a public-private partnership. And so that's the model that all ALS will exist in. And so yes, it's NIH funded, but on top of this, we're gonna get other types of funding streams that importantly include industry. And so they'll weigh in on how we're working and what we're doing and in response to that, then they're providing additional funding to keep everything moving forward. Great, thank you, that's very helpful, thanks so much. Um, we are very close to the end of our times, but I wanna give each of you the microphone for a moment and just share you know, your reflections on today's meeting and what's giving you hope in the field of ALS research right now. What about, let's start with you, Dr. Dagger. Let's start this way, going that way. <laughs> I feel very energized, actually, and um, Coming here is, is, is very positive for me personally, and I'll take the message that I'm feeling back home to the mothership, to the company. Um, there's a lot that has and continues to be happening in the field of CNS development and in ALS in particular, and we are at a prime time to seeing the fruit of these new discoveries moving forward. Um, 
and you know, including cell therapy and other forms of therapy. So it's, it's exciting times. Yes, oncology is ahead of us, but I think the race is there, and we, we will make a dent into these diseases, and certainly for ALS. Let me jump around a little bit. Anson, what about you? Um, yeah, I think energized is a great word. Um, you know, I think the meeting today was very well attended, and I'm, you know, I'm not sure there are a lot of people tuning in from home, but um, I think it's been a very positive experience hearing all these talks, which were each fantastic, and um, yeah, I'm feel honored to, to be involved and to present. Great, thanks. Nick, what's giving you hope in today's ALS? World? Yeah, I mean, I think just all the work in biomarkers, I think the genetic treatments, I think all the stuff going on in all the trials, just it's an exciting time and we're closer than ever before to actually find effective treatments. Really hot area. I'm last. Well, I guess... You're, I, you're last. I mean, you're, hope, you're our guest of honor. So. Hope, hope is, a, is a key word here. And, uh, you know, we're never fast enough. You know, we want to get, get improved treatments out to, out to everyone, out to the patients as quickly and effectively and safely as possible. But the hope is in the last five years, so much has happened. You know, we've had, we've had drugs approved, which, you know, that was a few decades between really is all to a Darabone. So in the last five years, we've had multiple drugs approved. That's exciting. There's so much interest in small, so many small companies that are jumped on ALS now because they see the possibilities, the possibilities of getting a drug across the finish line. So very exciting times. I'm honored to be here. And again, just really excited about where we're going. Thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause and thank you to all our presenters. Thank you to Dr. Anson Wilkes, Dr. Nicholas Olney, Dr. Robert Bowser, and Dr. Bob Dagger for all being here and sharing their time as well as traveling from far away. In particular, we also want to really revisit and thank our sponsors who have made this possible. Mitsubishi Tanama Pharma, Pharma America, United Access, Providence Brain and Spine Institute, Fortis Construction, Pharma, Performance Home Medical, and Analyx. So thank all of you sponsors for sponsoring today, for all the people here in the room, as well as for all the people watching at home and watching this recording following. Um, we're all in it together as a community to support and help one another, and we're committed to walking alongside every person in our community to have the best life possible while we all work together to find new treatments and cures. And we're thrilled to have such great um, guests who are doing amazing work. So thank all of you for your work. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, and everyone, for being here.